Well, it's Cox back on the old grindstone, I suppose. We're all holidayed out and got a fresh new year ahead of us. And what better way to greet the newly birthed 2015 than to spin on our heel 180 degrees and review the last few things from 2014, still dangling off it like poo out of a fish's ass? And no, I still don't mean Smash Brothers. The Christmas break for me is a time for relaxing, using troughs and conveyor belts as dining utensils, and getting completely bombed out of my skull on cocksucking cowboys. I'm not in the right mood for confusing fast-paced spectacle in a clashing rainbow of vibrant bubblegum colours that make me throw up a veritable landslide of Ferrero Rocher. I want to play something calm, slow-paced, and contemplative. So naturally I spent most of the fortnight playing a game by the developers of Serious Sam. No really, Crow Team went and made a philosophical puzzle game, and it's called The Talos Principle, which is the kind of title that if you saw it on the board outside a cinema, your gaze would immediately ricochet off onto Transformers 9 even larger stuff breaking. But dull title aside, you can really tell it's a Crow Team game, the looks fairly unmistakable with the ancient ruins and bright contrasting sunlight and impressive skyboxes they didn't bother to fence off in case anyone wants to explore a repeating sand texture for 20 minutes instead of the actual level where stuff happens. Happens, although you do get frog march back if you venture too far, which is kind of in keeping with the theme. You are an unknown consciousness that wakes up in an unknown garden where an unknown intelligence forces you to complete puzzles for an unknown reason. It's like when your parents used to make you sit in the garden and untangle the Christmas lights, and whenever you finished one, you were allowed to come in and watch one episode of The Prisoner. The occasional deliberate texture fuck up, at least I assume they're deliberate crow team, winky winky, leads us to conclude early on that we're in some kind of simulation, but as to who or what we are and why we're here, we have to piece that together from all together now, random documents and audio. Logs. I've heard some people compare this game to Portal, because that's the only point of reference these fucking millennials seem to have. First person puzzlers existed before Portal did, you know. You can make one without having to bow towards Bellevue. I mean, just because we're being herded through dangerous puzzles by a redoubtable disembodied voice for what is heavily implied to be some kind of behavioural experiment, okay, maybe it's a bit like Portal, but Talos Principle lacks two things that I would argue are absolutely central to Portal's identity. It doesn't have an innovative central game mechanic around which all else is based, and it has absolutely no sense of humour. But you know, after games like Sunset Overdrive and Sacred Three, very deliberately not trying to be funny and I'm willing to count as a virtue. And I did like the story element, there's a lot of rather dry mythological metaphor wanking in the random documents that I mostly skimmed over, but there are also emails and blogs from people in what is presumably the real world dealing with the mundanities of life while there's some kind of unclear catastrophe hanging over them that none of them want to directly reference, and I found it all very human and engaging. Certainly motivated me to keep pushing through the puzzles, which were trying my patience by the end, and as I said, if you've a roving eye for new gameplay mechanics you can jolly well rove off, squire. Hope you like weighing down switches with boxes and redirecting laser beams and everything else from the insert puzzle here guide to video game design, and then we introduce a time travel mechanic where you solve puzzles with temporal clones of yourself. I wish I could time travel back to the Newgrounds Flash programmer who first came up with that and hold his arms while my temporal clone punches him in the stomach. There are also a few obscure object mechanics that the game doesn't explain properly but bases puzzles around regardless. It's possible, for example, to put boxes on top of the roving proximity mines. It's not fair if you don't make all the rules clear. If I'm stuck in a puzzle game, I prefer it to be because I'm a big thicky bobo who can't figure out where all the pieces go, not because one of the pieces was still in the box. Forgive me if it didn't occur to me to go near the bleeping explodey death ball and repurpose it as a dessert trolley. The puzzles we complete in order to collect keys that let us advance to new worlds and eventually escape, they also draw out the pace at which we acquire new story nuggets, so if the puzzles feel kinda vacuous it's because they could be replaced by literally anything else, even in context it's admittedly busy work. It's Link's problem again, forever having to prove our sodding worth, cause the ancient ones never even considered that there are probably a great many terribly unworthy people who could figure out how to redirect a laser a beam. The game may be over long, as the puzzles seem to be running out of ideas by the end, to say nothing of all the optional ones. There are hidden stars in many levels, and that's all the clues you're getting. There's a hidden star somewhere in this huge cluttered map with tons of unused space, so serious Sam worthy you'd almost expect headless suicide bombers to come screaming round the corner at any moment. Strap on that truffle sniffing nose and good luck to you, Mr. Piggy! Yeah, not bothering, thanks. Also there are optional puzzles that unlock helpers to assist you with other puzzles. I'm having a bit of trouble passing that logic. Hey, I'm the kind of walking paradox that plays puzzle games but can't be bothered to solve puzzles, and in order to avoid having to solve a puzzle, I will now solve a puzzle, which will unlock a thing that will solve the first puzzle for me, and by solve I apparently mean give me a one line clue as to the solution, which left me a little bit put out, cause for the amount of effort involved I was expecting at least a short walkthrough and at the end perhaps to get tossed off with a smile. So in brief, the gameplay is like so many polystyrene packing peanuts in that it kinda feels like it's there to fill the space between the interesting parts, but honestly after completing it or at least all the non-optional bits, I can't deny I left the game quite satisfied and prepared to recommend. The fact that I still wanted to keep solving puzzles to explore more gorgeous scenery, get to the bottom of the mystery, and argue philosophy with the MS-DOS prompt attests enough that the 
the game is engaging and intelligent, which is all the more noteworthy considering where it came from. I mean, you ask Sirius Sam to redirect laser beams, he'd probably just redirect his bollocks into your eye sockets. Man, you don't see this kind of thing much these days. A title consisting of two adjectives. Remakes of nostalgic games that rely on crowdfunding to pay for all the rose-tinted glasses, on the other hand, that's slightly more common. But let me skip to the end for a moment. I quite enjoy playing Elite Dangerous, but that comes with the qualifier that I am a bit weird, and also quite enjoy playing Euro Truck Simulator. There's something relaxing about completing incredibly long, drawn-out, but totally uncomplicated tasks. Set your GPS, put your favourite podcast on, and while away the hours, sticking your head out the window pretending to be a King Charles Spaniel. In Euro Truck Simulator, I mean, not in Elite. That would end horribly. I think this would be a better world if we could all be more open about our weird pleasures. We might find that perhaps they're not as weird as we imagine. When I finally had the courage to stand up and say, you know what, I actually really like taking crystal meth. You'd be surprised how many of my cellmates are on the same page. Being over 30 and everything, I may be one of the nostalgia suckers Elite Dangerous is aimed towards, but I'd have been interested nonetheless. A bit of space trucking to catch up on some podcasts, and every now and again, fight someone to the death with lasers. There's long been a tendency for PC space sims to be rather dry affairs, caught somewhere between Wonders of the Universe and Microsoft Flight Simulator, where you need to use half the fucking keyboard to activate the cup holder. But thankfully, El Dangeroso seems to be on my level, and all the essential functions could be mapped to my 360 controller. Most of them, anyway. Over one single solitary additional button I could map to the fucking landing gear. But no, I guess I'll just have to keep the keyboard on my armrest like Wesley fucking Crusher. Of course the game was starting out with negative points, because I hate games that make you download a special installation client for it alone. I hate you play and origin enough for forcing me to leave the Steam comfort zone. But therefore all the games by a single company, so it makes sense in a treehouse fort no girls allowed kind of way. But installers for lone games, that's the kid who stays home alone smashing frogs with a hammer. I know it tends to be de rigueur for MMOs, but I'm not sure why you'd think Elite Dangerous was an MMO. I mean, they have the solo play option right there on the title menu. Anyone who clicks on anything else has only themselves to blame. I get quite enough grief from all the NPC ships, thank you very much, and at least their dialogue has been spell checked. I hasten to add, of course, that solo play apparently doesn't mean the same thing as offline play. You still have to have an internet connection even when you're not playing alongside other players, and I have no idea why. Maybe they're constantly gathering data on who's the best pilot so they can pass the details on to those aliens from the last Starfighter. But anyway, the usual sales pitch of Elite is that you can fill whatever role you want. Space trucker, space explorer, space blackbeard, if you can figure out how to set your beard on fire in a low oxygen environment. Before any of those, though, you do have to put in some hours of space crap out. There are a few things the game is bad at explaining, because it hails back to a time of manuals longer than Anita Sarkeesian's list of grievances. I scraped through combat training and thought I was ready to blaze the trail of Space Commander Yahtzee, hero of space. What's that? A notorious pirate whose name is an oblique reference to 20th century science fiction is wreaking havoc in the next system? Leave it to me, chief! I'll just warp right over there and then there's only 500 trillion cubic kilometres of space the scoundrel could be hiding in. Turns out if you've been sent to find something in a star system, you're supposed to investigate random unidentified signal sources, and if you roll a six, it'll be the thing you're looking for. So after a few false starts, I tracked down my prey. Your days are numbered, villain, I declared, and then I opened fire with my starting lasers, which had about as much impact as an attempt to spread marmalade on an angry walrus. Um, well I never said it was a small number, I said, before being smeared across time and space. Probably smarter to keep your head down with looting and trading until you can replace your twin laser pointers with actual weapons. So I found some ways to make money. It's hard to predict what the best cargo to move will be, but for that reason it's very satisfying when you do start making profits. Yes indeed, I'd say to myself, call me Space Commander Yahtzee the Second, hero of shopping. And then I investigated a signal and found some crates of fine art floating in space. I would swiftly learn that cargo found in such a way is classified as illegal goods, and a lot of spaceports fine you for showing up with illegal goods. In fact, more than once I was fined for showing up with illegal goods that I needed to complete a quest in that spaceport, which struck me as very unfair. And illegal goods can only be sold in the black market, which A, not every spaceport has, and B is on the contacts menu rather than commodities, so the trial and error that was needed to figure this all out made me feel like the world's worst undercover cop. Hello, could someone direct me to the black market so I could sell all this highly illegal cargo? Thank you, Mr. Black Marketeer. I will certainly think of you next time I have some stolen goods. Would you mind spelling out your name and address into this microphone? So Elite Dangerous does take a bit of learning, but once I was a savvy star pilot, it became very absorbing. It controls intuitively enough that space battles are fun, but because they're the exception rather than the rule and most of your time is spent space trucking, then they feel more special because they're just a small part of a larger life you're building for yourself, and I kind of like that in a game, but again do bear in mind that I am a weirdo, largely shunned by the daywalkers. Maybe I like Elite for the stories it lets me make up in my own head. Don't know if it should score points for that, that's just leaving blanks for me to fill in. Space Commander Yahtzee II, for example, met his end after a galaxy-wide police chase, when a pirate organisation that had seemed so nice at the time suckered him into shooting down innocent traders, embittered his son, Space Commander Yahtzee III, eschewed human company and chose a life of exploring the furthest stars, until his own tragic death when he walked into a sun. Details are sketchy as to why he did this, but his last known transmission suggests that his podcast had just ended and he must have alt-tabbed out of the game to find another one. So it continues to be catch-ups month rather than few coast is clear season, when everything that pussied out of a harrowing Christmas release nervously returns to the water's edge with freshly reinflated floaties, and this week it's time for a spot of indie horror, and we'll start with something that rivals Smash Brothers for most frequently requested, albeit by far savvier correspondents who know that the hungry shark is best tempted with meat, not pink wafer biscuits. Five days of stre- I mean five nights at Freddy's has the distinction
distinction of being one of the few completely unique concepts to debut last year, and achieves with nothing but a strategic arrangement of still images and pre-rendered animations worthy of a mid-90s CD-ROM game what something like The Evil Within can't manage with the finest graphics technology absurdly inflated budgets can buy. It freaks my fucking balls off. Maybe that's thanks to my long-standing fear of people in mascot costumes, but honestly all the characters could have been replaced with smiling photos of George Hamilton and the effect would have been much the same. The premise is, you are the night shift security guide, a Chuck E. Cheese style traditional birthing ground for childhood trauma, where the animatronic characters have sung Happy Birthday one too many times and now have an alarming habit of roaming around at night looking for something to kill. In defense of which you have the most illogical security system since the biscuit proximity alarm, consisting of two security doors that require power to remain closed, rather than say gravity, or strategic use of a filing cabinet barricade. You are tasked to watch the security cameras and strategically lock the doors when something is drawing close lest you suffer death by jump scare. It's a remarkable recreation of the kind of logic one encounters in a nightmare, paralyzed by this encroaching horror that only you seem to recognize as such but can't escape from. And in many ways that's why I don't like it. Oh, dropped a critic bomb there! It does its job too well. I can't play it for more than a few minutes at a time without getting too agitated and having to stop. Yeah, look at this giant pussy over here. Better pull my hat down before my clitoris starts showing. But the thing about jump scares is that in horror there's something I more grudgingly tolerate than want. Silent Hill 2, as I'm fond of saying, has almost none at all. They're to horror what the fart joke is to comedy. They're like jerking off on a roller coaster, all anticipation followed by a very brief high and then a long shameful come down, no pun intended, after the person sitting in front of you realizes what just coated the back of their neck. I hate being jump startled. I don't seek it out as entertainment. If I suspect that jump scares are lying in wait as I prowl around the corridors of dead space or amnesia, I want to know that I can respond by opening fire or legging it in the opposite direction going, <laughs> you know, something proactive, not just sitting in one place waiting for the jump scare to happen. For someone who's pretty anxious by default, the tension is more than I can bear. Again, no pun intended. I joked about Sonic Boom being more endurance test than game, but that seems to be the sole intention of Six Days, Seven Nights. An endurance test, not to be played for fun, but recorded for you to scream all over for the benefit of your YouTube followers. So while I can't deny the effectiveness of FNAF, if I wanted to be that tense, I'd phone up Detective Harrison and make another futile attempt to confess before the voices take over again. And I don't want to be that tense, because I don't find it fun. How can I recommend a game if I can only play it for three minutes before reflexively slamming escape because the pink thing moved again? That's not what I'd call engaged. Although I like how the escape key immediately shuts the game down. I wish every tense situation had one of those. Congratulations, Janice. When's the baby due? Um, I'm not pregnant, I just put on some weight. Abort! Fwoosh! But let's move on to the second game I wanted to bring up, because it's a better example of the kind of thing I mean when I talk about horror. Less nervously waiting for something to jump out like I drank too much coffee before using the whack-a-mole machine, and more the horror of the human condition, this war of mine. Phew, I'm not tense anymore. Now I'm just miserable. Hooray! You control a small group of refugees in a city devastated by war, but all the actual warring is going on off-screen in some no doubt terribly exciting first-person shooter, while your task is to keep your head down and find enough food and supplies to keep the abandoned building you called Bagsies on halfway livinable. Livinable, 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 livinable. Li sorry. During the day, you craft tools and weapons and extract whatever nutrients you can from sucking on the washing up towel. And at night, one of your number goes out scavenging for more resources. It's easy at first to scrape up the useful contents of a bombed out sweet shop, but the lootable areas are finite. And sooner or later, you need to graduate from robbing the dead to robbing the very much alive and hoping to stay that way. There's kind of a watershed moment when you're robbing an old man's house and you can't avoid being spotted, but then he just stands there whining at you as you pinch all his shit. It is rather sad, although lessened when my refugee then came home with the sad status effect. I still hate when a game tries to tell me how I'm feeling. Beep boop, sad event detected, engaging sadness, tears deployed. This is where things unravel a bit. The game makes an admirable effort to give each refugee a voice and backstory, but in practice the tiny characters in their arcadey 2D environments are all kind of interchangeable. They all whine constantly, they're all equally good at building transistor radios, and none of their mums ever showed them how to pack shopping properly, so their entire inventory space is filled after searching a single pile of garbage. Important construction materials having smaller stacks than a diabetic visit to the pancake house. I got complacent after a while and my scavenger was shot dead while stealing from the rebels, but I didn't care. My two survivors dutifully threw their head levers to the sad setting, but I was like, oh stop whining, more washing up towels to go round. I like this War of Minds natural gameplay escalation, but if you want a game that really captures the struggle to maintain humanity in an extreme situation, I'd recommend Papers, Please first. This is more like someone got Lars von Trier to remake Little Computer People. It is an unfortunate fact of life in the world of entertainment that the unique is rarely successful, and indeed that the successful is rarely unique. And when the dread god Cthulhu in his cosmic throne crosses his legs and sneakily cracks one off, causing the stars to align and something to come out that is both unique and successful, it's all but a guarantee that it will not be remaining unique for very long, as the imitators arrive to bring out a few golden calves for everyone to worship while Moses is fannying about up the mountain. Dark Souls, for example, was a great game and pretty unique in this day and age for having gameplay more complex than a fucking traffic light, so here comes Lords of the Fallen to hoover up everyone still milling around 
in the same comfort zone. Not that I want to imply that setting out to rip off Dark Souls is lazy. It's not like Flappy Bird, where you can have 12 of them out by close of business the same day. Dark Souls is huge, complex, tightly designed, and attracts a middlingly rabid fanbase. Imitating it isn't lazy, it's just suicidal. So you remember how Dark Souls had this intro cinematic showing old-timey war between ancient heroes and it wasn't immediately obvious why, until later after you meet every single one of the motherfuckers and dodge roll them to death? Lords of the Fallen does a slightly similar thing. It shows an intro cinematic of the main character having a fight with a giant monster, and again it's not immediately obvious why, and then I played through the whole game and it still wasn't. Maybe it was some kind of proof of concept animation they threw in when they didn't have time to make a proper intro, because at the end of it a caption comes up that essentially says, Meanwhile, over in the real plot, we start in Medias Res with the protagonist Harkin, as in take that dog into the garden, he's about to start Harkin all over the carpet, entering a monster infested citadel for unclear reasons, and I can picture a conversation taking place between the creators. Let's keep the story to the background and let players piece it together from context just like Dark Souls. Yes, that way we can have a story that doesn't interfere with game flow. But we don't want to be accused of ripping Dark Souls off, so let's also put in a bunch of clunky dialogue trees with twats. Yep, yeah, mmm, uh, mmm. Another way Lords of the Fallen seems to have taken great pains to differentiate itself from Dark Souls is to take Dark Souls' very clean and deficient visual design and hardcore it up a notch or twelve. So that means Harkin looks like Kratos, cosplaying as War from Darksiders, with more belts than a depressive Sunday afternoon whiskey binge, and monster face pauldron so large you might as well have strapped a washer dryer combo to his shoulders. You know, that whole over detailed concept artist mistakenly submitted the design he'd been doodling on for the last half hour school of aesthetics, where the first enemy in the game is a huge demon soldier all armour and scar tissue with a flaming skull for a head and one motorbike short of an Iron Maiden album cover. But when you start at that level you've got nowhere to go, have you? It doesn't take that long to upgrade yourself to the point that the starting enemies go down in less hits than a carton of Umbongo, and suddenly looking badass carries no credibility whatsoever. Well, so far I've mainly been going on about how Lords of the Fallen isn't like Dark Souls, so let me clarify. It's a hacky slashy RPG with combat based around shielding, dodging and stamina management, the enemies all come back when you die, and your health potions are refilled at checkpoints, so its intention to imitate is written in neon letters on its giant spinning bow tie. There are tweaks to the formula, you can use a checkpoint without bringing the enemies back, but your experience multiplier resets when you do, forcing you to weigh up the pros and cons of pressing on versus playing safe. But Dark Souls had the same dilemma anyway, because the enemies did respawn when you used the checkpoint, so we haven't gone anywhere, we've just rearranged the furniture a bit. It's also a much more linear game. Occasionally there are two paths to take, but only one is the right way, and one is a way you're supposed to take later on, and you find out which is which by seeing whether or not you are immediately reduced to the dimensions of a sheet of greaseproof paper. It's also a lot shorter, and I get the strong feeling shorter than the developers originally intended, from the way one or two boss monsters show up without warning or ceremony in areas that have already been used for something else, like a wide-eyed first-timer being suddenly shoved onto stage to fill a ten-minute gap at the open mic night. But the funny thing about Lords of the Fallen is that I do have my complaints about Dark Souls, and Fords of the Lawland takes every single one of them and runs with it. For example, I was annoyed how often Dark Souls 2 fell back on boring old dudes in armour. Common monster here, a boss fight there, those dudes in armour everywhere, and lo and behold that's pretty much all you fucking fight in Lords of the Fallen. That and the occasional malformed, multi-limbed horror, like someone smashed two plasticine dudes in armour together. Also, while Dark Souls hitboxes were taking no small amount of piss, Fjords of the Lawnmower is smuggling two kegs of urine under its absurdly large pauldrons. You can get hit by an attack that happened in the next room on this day four score and seven years ago. As I said, to deliberately evoke a popular game so heavily always feels like a very illogical move because the comparison is as unavoidable as it is unfavourable. But even by its own merits, Inlets of the Hedge Trimmer falls short. I think the environment artist got as far as writing down Snowy Castle before someone hammered a nail into a wall two streets away and they were immediately stunlocked and hurled from their chair. You are never not in a snowy castle. In fact, at one point you pass through a portal into the demonic realm to meet them on their home turf and it too is a fucking snowy castle. It's like the Dandruff Sufferer's annual European Heritage Sightseeing Tour. Because this is what happens when you over-design, everything looks the same, buried under unnecessary details and belt buckles, plagued by invisible walls as well. I have fond memories of my attempt to sneak up and backstab on a guard being foiled by him cunningly having stood on the far side of a slight incline in the ground. All in all, Fallen is a game pushing to do too much with not enough, spackling the holes where creativity fell short until the spackle is all I can see. Ambitious, in a way analogous to setting out to transport nine tons of sand using only your mouth. Consider, if you will, the strange niche art form that is the wacky standalone expansion. Small games chopped out of larger games with a new coat of paint and no obligation to directly follow the original. They're the youngest, runtiest member of the slightly inbred rural extended family that is the AAA games industry, clad in hand-me-down trousers that have known five generations of ball sweat and occasionally forgotten about when the parents are buying Christmas presents, going on holiday, or evacuating the house in the event of catastrophic fire. But since they're not under as much scrutiny, they can get away with being a bit more out there than their progenitors, and you might end up with something like Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. Not always, of course. Most of the time they just add the inevitable fucking zombies, as in Undead Nightmare, Yakuza Dead Souls, or that one rather curious train simulator expansion, because imagination continues to be the black market contraband of the AAA world, and creative freedom is not a whole lot of use without it. It's like drilling a glory hole six feet off the floor. Now on the surface, Saints Row 4 seems like the very last game that needs a wacky standalone expansion. We successfully shifted our GTA knockoff sandbox crime series into a game about a superpowered president fighting aliens, said Vincent Volition one day. And now we can do something even crazier with it. Yes, we could even design a new sandbox city instead of repainting the one from Saints Row 3 over 
over and over again. You're fucking fired. But of course it was in Saints Row 3 that they introduced zombies as a subplot and it rather brought the whole thing down for me. Zombies are entry level creative freedom shit. I clean zombies off the sides of my fucking toilet bowl every morning. So that was out. And the Far Cry Blood Dragon route was out because Saints Row 4 already did the sudden left turn into wacky sci-fi land. Therefore the only path remaining was obviously to lampoon popular interpretations of Christian dogma. And so we have Saints Row Gat Out of Hell. And if you mentally got through that title without getting meatloaf stuck in your head then you've given yourself away replicant human. Well time to write some snarky things about a comedy game's plot because I'm the kind of guy who'll try to light a swimming pool on fire. While flying around space the president, who gratifyingly takes the appearance you gave them if you've got a Saints Row 4 save file lying around somewhere, gets kidnapped by Satan to be forcibly married to his daughter Jezebel so Johnny Gat and Kinsey Kensington travel to hell to bring him out. So right off the bat we ditch one of the greatest strengths of the Saints series, the psychotic amorphous entity that is the protagonist, sculpted by the player but given agency by the game, simultaneously something that belongs to us but which can also surprise us with their actions, which I suppose provides enough incentive to rescue the bastard, but considering that a lot of the humour derives from slick dialogue between the many characters, it's disappointing that the cast is almost immediately pared down to two of the least interesting ones. We seem to be still persisting in the notion that Johnny Gat is this really great character, but I've never really bored that. He's good at violence, but then so is every recurring character in Saints Row now, and all he's got beyond that is a hairdo that looks like a cake decoration. Saints Row as a series is a master of putting a whole lot of care into looking like it doesn't care at all, like a pickup artist five minutes before closing time, but there's just plain less effort evidence in Gat Out of Hell. It's disappointing how much of the plot is relayed tell-don't-show style in a narration over some still images, and here there may be a temptation to throw up the it's only twenty dollars card as one would a crucifix to a vampire, but they are a bit of a crutch at times. They're used when you first enter hell to hastily explain that your first ally, the main villain of Saints Row 2, gives you a magic halo that lets you fly and cast spells, and I would think since it drives most of the gameplay that this would call for slightly more ceremony, and perhaps an explanation as to how Mr. Saints Row 2 villain man got hold of it and what he was doing with it before we came along. Without further context, I choose to picture him putting it on his knob and spinning it around like a hula hoop. The superpowers are mainly similar to the ones from Saints Row 4, you've got your freeze blast and your super stomp that is still the best opening argument in the great flight versus groundling debate. The fast movement mechanic that makes the vehicles completely pointless is more about controlled flight this time around, and there are a couple of new side missions that make the most of it, like catching falling souls before they hit the ground, so enough has been changed that it can be called slightly more than a palette swap. I say side missions, but technically they aren't because there isn't anything to be on the side of. Rather than a critical path in the traditional sense, your only task is to do whatever activities you like until Satan gets pissed off enough to open up the final boss fight, which on the one hand is very much in the spirit of cathartic sandbox gaming, but on the other for me is kind of like eating a meal consisting only of bread rolls and ketchup packets. The closest thing to a central story campaign is like two cutscenes in the middle of the sandbox orgy, one of which momentarily brings the game to life when it turns into a musical, is like a small taste of what might have been if, say, they hadn't blown the whole story budget on one elaborate musical cutscene. Paradoxical, really. Anyway, you get to the end, you kill Satan, and then you get a classic case of ending Tron 3000 where you just pick one of five options, each leading to a two second finale, and frankly I'd rather they'd slapped all the combined effort into one crazy blowout of an ending, because then I wouldn't have had to go back and fight Satan four more times to see the rest of it, which I wouldn't have done at all if I hadn't found what I presume was a design oversight that meant I could freeze blast Satan and hit him with the rocket launcher and kill him in four hits. But in a way that might be missing the point. The point is to shoot for 100% and make the most of this additional chunk of Saints Row 4 for people who used up the original, but it's almost like Get Out of Hell is cramming Saints Row 4's already crowded arsenal of features into a much smaller space. Most of it gets pretty redundant since my basic rocket launcher is now technically the usurper of evil's throne. While it's nice to be back in this world for a few more hours, even the kitchen sink approach needs to stack up the plates in some kind of order and I don't think we used enough washing up liquid. So last week I described zombie stories as entry level creativity, but the flaw in that analogy is that it implies that one eventually moves on from it as opposed to loitering in the entrance hall ineptly flirting with the receptionist. Dying Light is a game that if it ever found an original thought in its head would probably assume it was a tumour. This ostensibly new IP plays a lot like Dead Island, I thought, before noticing that it comes to us from the same developer as Dead Island, which confused me for a bit because I assumed they were working on Dead Island 2, currently represented by a pre-rendered trailer that has always tells us as much about the game as it does about freshwater fly fishing, but apparently that's being developed by Jaeger, creators of Spec Ops The Line, a game about an American agent being inserted into a Middle Eastern city on an innocuous fetch quest and confronting death, horror and violence while getting a lovely suntan. But I digress. Dying Light is a game about an American agent being inserted into a Middle Eastern city on an innocuous fetch quest and confronting death, horror and- Oh god, everything's spiralling in on itself! What are these things in front of me? Jesus Christ, they're my own buttocks! At least I assume Haran is in the Middle East, it's got a Middle Easty sort of name, but if you went by the absurd variety of accents that the general population has, you might assume the city was located inside a middle school play about the joys of diversity. Unless the zombies are the general population and everyone else is a visiting tourist, it's not like we're given any better explanation for why there are zombies here, but then I suppose we hardly need one at this point. It's a city, it's got a lot of sewers and building sites, and it's a video game. Sooner or later zombies will just grow out of the fucking mildew. Our hero is Kyle Crane, so called because he's quite tall and tends to overreach himself, who's been dropped into zombie town to recover a stolen file which is important for some contrived reason I didn't quite absorb, and shacks up with the nice survivors who oppose the local warlord whose evilness defies all reason and sense, the kind of bloke who couldn't even have a boiled egg for breakfast unless he could bring in the hen and force it to watch. If the zombie genre were a school, 
dying light would be the good little boy who irons his uniform every morning and is the first to tattle on the rowdy boys when they start getting a bit too self-aware and ironic. So the list of cliches is adhered to like a randy dog on his master's leg. There's the good scientist and the no-nonsense action lady, and the major theme is that human beings are the real monsters if that wasn't already clear from how much the developers have blatantly copy-pasted out of Dead Island. The same first-person sandbox mission-based gameplay, the same kick button which is a constant source of amusement when an enemy is trying to stand up. There's the same looting and weapon crafting system in which we can sell a tape of battery to a crowbar and give it lightning powers, because apparently engineering works the same way as homeopathy now. The special zombies are exactly the same, Captain Fast Zombie, Admiral Big Lad with Hammer and Fleet Commander explodes in your face, and just like Dead Island, every other level is set in a fucking sewer. We spend more time knocking poo around than the consumer review section of Anal Sex Monthly. But here's a conundrum, boys and girls, if Dying Light is basically just Dead Island again, then why do I like it more? Well, it's more tightly designed, instead of making us choose one of several specialised characters and then learn the hard way that anyone other than the melee weapons guy might as well wear pork chops for earrings, they just gave us the melee weapons guy. And he actually has character and personal conflicts and engages with people instead of just going around gormlessly piling up fetch quests, which generally helps things feel less flat and lifeless, no pun intended. Actually, I guess that makes sense since the title has been upgraded from dead to dying. Most noteworthy is the pseudo-eponymous feature concerning the day-night cycle. If you hang around after dark, then you have to deal with super chasey zombies who for some reason just get so mad when people don't take curfews seriously. And it says something for how mundane zombies have become that it's only in these nighttime segments that dying light comes anywhere near the horror game classification. Because at that point, twatting the lurching dead around suddenly gives way to fleeing like Princess Diana from photojournalists, and often with roughly the same result. That brings us to the next, I hesitate to use the word unique, selling point, parkour, which further improves on Dead Island by adding some verticality to the world and freeing up the movement a bit. You know, after Mirror's Edge, I was convinced that parkour from a first person perspective just couldn't possibly work. But Dying Light has shown that I was completely right to think that. Precision landing on small platforms and narrow ledges when you can't see your feet is still like trying to hit a pinata with a live cat, and during climbing sequences you're mostly treated to a face full of ledge and can't tell how far along you've climbed without laboriously peering around like a contortionist trying to look at the person who's giving it to them doggy style. I can't think how the game could have been anything but improved with a third person perspective. Would have helped when I'm trying to pick a lock and want to know if a zombie is about to run up and file its tax return down my bum crack, but I suppose first person does carry the benefit of sparing us the weird contortions Kyle's body goes through when the climbing mechanics fuck up, and they fuck up a lot. When the game demands that I climb a radio mast to impress all its friends at Ubisoft and has me do a running jump off a ledge roughly 10 centimetres wide, then zones out and doesn't register that I'm trying to grab the next ledge so I fall to a painful clumsy death, you'll forgive me if I don't see it as my fault. So when the game then goes, now I'm going to take some of your experience away as punishment for being such a crap out, I'm not exactly won over. But overall, as I said, it's better than Dead Island, so if you enjoyed Dead Island but thought I'd be enjoying this so much more if it wasn't shit, give it a go. But in the context of Dead Island 2 being handed to a different developer, Dying Light's improvement takes on a certain poignancy. It's like an unfit parent desperately trying to win over the judge. Please, Mr. Deep Silver, we can make good zombie games now, please let us see our child. I don't know, Techland, Jaeger can do really complex storytelling, so can we! Look at our complex villain! Is there a bit where he screams the protagonist's name like William Shatner in The Wrath of Khan? Maybe? Get out of my office, Techland! You ever get the feeling that the big fancy ship we've had so much fun on over the years has started sitting a bit lower in the water than it used to? And when we bring our concerns to the captain we find him doubled over with his pants round his ankles and his nose shoved up his asshole because he was curious to know if it's possible to survive by breathing your own farts? I've been feeling that way about the AAA sector of the industry for some time now. What isn't a sequel is a knockoff. What isn't a knockoff is a reboot. What isn't a reboot is a remastering. Even a dog chasing its own tail has the sense not to bite it off and try to sell it as a draft excluder. Still, I'll take a remaster bait over a rebooty call because like all culture, games exist as a historical record can teach us a lot about technology and attitudes of the past, all of which is lost if you remake it every ten years with all new gritty realism and testicle physics. I always appreciate the kind of remastering that lets you see how far we've come, with the special button that turns the graphics back to the original low-res version like you've opened a gateway to the LEGO dimension. But the games that do get remastered and preserved thusly are getting picked pretty fucking arbitrarily, in what seems to be a fucking open season on remasterings. Resident Evil, a poster child for aging poorly second only to Macaulay Culkin, Fahrenheit Indigo Prophecy remastered. In order for something to be remastered it has to have been mastered in the first place, the most you can do with Fahrenheit is re-bollocks it up. But on the positive side we have Grim Fandango remastered, which I'm going to cover fully because the original would have been a prime candidate for retro review if it could have been persuaded to run on any computer built after the turn of the millennium. Grim Fandango is an adventure game created by Tim Schafer back in his LucasArts days, and remains officially the last original thought anyone has had even within earshot of LucasArts. It's now been clawed from the Sarlacc pit and re-released by Tim Schafer's Double Fine with all new remastered graphics, by which I mean the same graphics but the models have better definition. Although considering that all the characters look like they're wearing 
paper bag skull masks, definition was never really an issue there, and there was a limit to how much the pre-rendered baked in background art could be zhuzhed up, so it still looks like a 3D modelling portfolio by someone who refuses to move on from the Amiga 1200. Alternative control schemes have also been added, since this was back before there was as much competition for your time, and you could say, you'll take our tank controls and fucking like them, player. Both alternatives have their issues, of course, with mouse controls you run by double clicking, but it doesn't work when you're clicking on an interactable object, which are the only reason to move anywhere. Using a controller with the camera-based controls has the usual issue when the camera is constantly changing angle and position, causing the main character to suddenly spin on his heel as it does so, like he just walked into a brothel and saw his future father-in-law. And when you get into a vehicle, suddenly all bets are off what pushing analog stick will do, unless you bet that it will not be whatever you wanted it to do. But I don't want to harp at it for not being remastered enough, because as I said, preservation is the important part, and it's heartening just for it to be available to everyone who might never have been able to play it before. Kind of the opposite problem to what Fahrenheit has, which is finding anyone that might want to have played it before. On that note, the attitude of preservation is taken to an admirable degree in Grim Fandango Remastered. The original was completely bugged up the arse as well. Glitches accelerated as the game went on, and I had a nice juicy crash and forced reboot some ways in. Now I know why the game opened with a message saying, hey, there's no death or failure state, but maybe you should frequently save anyway. Wink, wink, tap, nose. Yes, we have heard of autosave, but we don't want you getting complacent. You know how it goes? Autosaves one day, sudden spike in the infant, death rate the next. Well, that about wraps up the technical side of things. Let's move on to the more interesting question. Does Grim Fandango still hold up? It's set in the Aztec afterlife, through which the dead must journey for four years to reach eternal rest, and we play as Manny Calavera, a travel agent whose job is to sell travel upgrade packages to the newly dead. Kind of a plot hole here, because the quality of the travel package is supposed to be based on how good they were in life, so I don't see how he'd be able to upgrade them. There's a rather hasty throwaway line concerning the money you were buried with, but I don't see how two coins on your eyelids will fund much more than a trip to the snack machine. Anyway, Manny's attempts to cheat the system gets an innocent woman tied up in a sinister plot and he must embark upon his own four-year journey to find her and gain redemption. Now, I've been increasingly down on adventure games over the years because they're just linear stories broken up with glorified key hunting puzzles, often riding a train of logic that took on a few too many passengers that bat shit on sea, but Grim Fandango demonstrates how to juice that particular lemon. It's just a matter of using puzzles to further the story rather than interrupt it. Poor exemple, the high spot of the game is year two, when Manny is running a nightclub in a gambling town. From one dry objective of securing passage on the next ship out, the usual chain of use thing on thing to get next thing is threaded through a showcase of colourful intrigues and characters that Manny's gotten to know over the last year, and it paints him as much more likeable and savvy than the standard adventure game stock clueless twat. Bit of a story gameplay clash at one point when Manny witnesses the murder and tragic death scene of a friend, and then after composing himself blackmails the murderer into letting him steal some fucking tools. I suppose it works with Manny's overall redemptive character arc, but it's kind of short-sighted for a guy with no eyes, and the game never gets back to that level, kind of loses steam from the ship section onwards, ironically. The last two years get a bit hasty and scrappy. Not a deal breaker, but if like me you get most of the way through and the game crashes half an hour after the last save, it might be what makes you pack it in. Fuck it. I basically remember how it ends. If I wanted to start gambling on crash likelihood, I'd buy a super saver package on Malaysia Airlines. I'm a patriotic citizen of single player, as you know. I understand the need for the nation of multiplayer, and we'll even holiday there sometimes to see all the people in the pavement cafes wanking for pennies day in day out. But when the armies of multiplayer start gathering at the border, I'll be all up on that barricade like Jean Valjean. Hey, come buy this overblown multiplayer mode. Don't worry, the bots mean it's also single player and therefore we can charge 80 bucks for it. It's shit with bots and you fucking knew it. Whoops, guess you better subscribe to the online service then. And while you've got that credit card out, perhaps you'd like to look over this hundred bucks worth of DLC content we arbitrarily left out of the game at launch. AAA Gaming? What the the fuck do you need all this money for? Does GDC get so wild these days you have to hush up legions of rent boys with assholes stuffed full of birthday cake? Or are you just feeding it all to the dread god Nyarlathotep in return for guaranteed 8 out of 10 reviews? I know what you're not spending it on, making games good, because if you were we'd all be on the holodeck by now, fisting Councillor Troy. Evolve then. That wasn't an instruction, sit down. Humanity has colonised a faraway planet called Sheer, apparently discovered by sheer luck, only to find that the place is teeming with prehistoric monsters, which I'm assuming the estate agents left out of the initial viewing, so the people started to wonder if an evacuation mightn't be prudent. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. A colourful band of mercenaries are called in to keep the monsters occupied while the populace gets the hell out of Dodge, and this provides the background for the actual gameplay, in which four co-op players go up against a monster controlled by a fifth player. Would be very innovative indeed if Left 4 Dead didn't exist. Well, honestly, it's the tank encounter from Left 4 Dead crossed with the boss fight against the end from Metal Gear Solid 3. Most of the fight is blundering around the open-ended wilderness looking for the sodding thing, broken up by brief exciting moments of getting blatted in the face with chunks of tarmac. It's like motocross for the blind. I knew straight away that playing as the monster was going to be my bread and jam, because who the fuck wants to drag 
three distracted tit nibblers around like a dog walker passing through a sausage festival, when the monster is beholden to none but themselves, hiding from Team Sausage and devouring wildlife in an orgy of self-gratification, which felt like a rather appealing analogy for the entire state of single-player gaming in an increasingly multiplayer-focused industry. Speaking of, Evolve is a new friend for Titanfall to frolic with in the wonderful Evergreen Meadow, where next-gen multiplayer-only games can be sold for full price. There's no solo experience, really. Playing against bots just isn't fun. They're way too coordinated. You want to be the monster against players that react appropriately to being pinned against a cliff and systematically double-fisted in every hole, panicking and fucking up and all blaming each other in the chat room afterwards, tee hee. Of course, the real challenge is finding a public game where you can successfully win the monster role instead of getting shunted onto Team Bellend and immediately quitting to try again. Yes, I was that asshole. There's a matchmaking system where you stack the five different player roles in order of preference, so I put in monster first and trapper last, whereupon the game sat juggling its bollocks for five minutes, then said, oh I get you, you want to be assigned as the trapper four times in a fucking row. So either there's something wrong with it, or no one else wants to play as the fucking trapper either. Probably because their main job is to throw out the big arena net that stops the monster from fleeing and then going around the other players with a sandwich platter and a selection of drinks while they do the rest of the work. Whoops, hold the phone, the guy who was assigned monster just dropped out of the lobby, Evolve. Can I take his place now? Sorry, can't hear you, I'm pushing birthday cake up a rent boy's ass. But if you keep trying, eventually the laws of probability are on your side and you should get into a game as the monster before nightfall, at which point you can happily run around by yourself eating animals until you're fully upgraded and can take revenge on the human players for trying to involve you in their multiplayer rubbish, the bastards. So I guess there's something for everyone, but I consider it overpriced because it is largely one central concept of humans hunt monster monster floss teeth with humans and everything else is so much damp cladding around the exterior. There are multiple gameplay modes but not much changes besides what needs to be defended and how many of them there are. And there's also a campaign mode that strings five random games together with benefits granted to whichever side won the last one. And this, the game assures us, means that there are hundreds of thousands of unique campaign experiences. Aren't you glad to have bought a game with such relentless variety? The marketing copy doth protest too much, methinks. There are more combinations for a deck of cards than there are atoms in the universe, but Solitaire nevertheless starts to feel a bit samey after the first few billion games. Progress is gained by the game unlocking new characters after you demonstrate mastery of each of the base character's skills, so I dutifully flung tarmac frisbees around till I'd knocked out enough teeth to unlock the second of the three playable monsters. And then suddenly, it stopped, hurling an entire parking space at someone and then Goomba stomping the medic and then charging the other two so that between the four of them I tarmacked a new highway out of guts. That was fun, impactful and cathartic. The new monsters' attacks were all variations on a theme of farting lightning around, and that wasn't fun. And it rather killed any motivation I had to unlock the third monster, or indeed play at all. The scales fell and I rose, blinking into the daylight, and I realised that the problem with the Evolve gameplay model is that the experience is so anticlimactic. Let me put a feeler out to grope your collective titties, if I may. Who is still playing Titanfall? Very few of you, I shouldn't wonder. I'll wager there's a lot of equipment that you once put a lot of effort into unlocking, now kicking its heels against the side of an empty server, because you got none of the satisfaction or closure that comes from reaching the end of a good story, or completing the last of an increasingly hard series of structured challenges. Your interest just gradually peters out and you stop. Here, I'll show you what I mean. What is Order 1886? Well, it's a phrase that would be shouted from the counter of an unusually busy takeout restaurant. Okay, what's THE Order 1886? Oh, that! It's a PS4 exclusive shooter set in an alternative universe in which King Arthur's knights discovered the Holy Grail and have existed up to the 19th century as a sort of peacekeeping order of immortal warriors. Nice little idea in a cut-price League of Extraordinary Gentlemen sort of way. Just a shame that it had to be attached to such an utterly inconsequential game. Like a birthday card tied to an unsecured balloon. I'm gonna have to make a list of all the words that used to refer to positive things but which I now associate with pain. Like gameplay trailer, Ubisoft, Backdoor Romance. Got a new one now, exclusive title, which used to mean better make the best game we possibly can to show off the potential of this cutting edge device that we just convinced you to buy instead of 200 iOS games or a year's supply of Twix, but now means when you don't have to compete, you don't have to care. The exclusive game is now like a trophy wife. As long as it wears its prettiest dress, it doesn't have to do shit but stand there smiling with the YouTube buffering symbol cycling in its eyes. So while The Order 1886 has very pretty graphics, it plays like a laundry list of the blandest game mechanics yet devised by man. The absolute bare minimum to keep the needle smack in the middle, slipping into neither engagingly good nor amusingly bad. So it's another fucking cover-based shooter spiritually akin to Space Invaders, except at least the aliens got faster in Space Invaders as you thin their ranks. The Order's idea of ramping shit up is to spawn another identical crowd of goons the moment you polish off the first, just in case you haven't had enough time to appreciate the current murky over-designed room. At other times we must reap a healthy harvest of quick time events, largely used for some poor excuses for boss fights. Oh yes, and Nikola Tesla shows up as a character, which I feel always comes across as a transparent and desperate attempt to go, ooh look at all the nerd cred we've 
god, splattering wetly down our inner thighs. Tesla's presence is part of this whole electropunk aesthetic that only seems to exist to justify boring typical modern warfare shooter weapons being around in Victorian times. In fact, the Order seems to be making eye contact with Rise Son of Rome as they both stare forlornly out through the fences of their respective death camps. They are the stuff of the spunk gargle wee wee modern shooter behind the thin disguise of an alternative setting, a funk marble tee he, if you will. In fact, the moment that crossed my mind, I realised that the plot of the Order is point for point identical to the plot of Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. We are Sir Galahad, a veteran loyal member of the Order with the face of Al Swearingen from Deadwood and the vocabulary of a shaved bear, pledged to defend the land from evil terrorists, I mean werewolves, but then finds themselves having to fight off a civilian resistance, and in situations like this you can put money down right fucking now on his high-tech authoritarian big boys club proving corrupt, and him switching sides to a resistance movement surprisingly accepting of a dude who murdered 200 of their mates that morning, a remarkably inconsistent one at that. Grr, I'm loyal to the Order. Your Order is corrupt and I have proof. Grr, I hate you, but I will come and look at your proof as long as we don't kill any people on the way to it and defend my cast iron sense of justice. We need to kill some people on the way to it. Say no more! Brrr. Now at this point you might be understandably confused if, like me, you'd gotten the impression from the teaser and assorted marketing that this was a game about fighting werewolves. In truth, you fight eight or nine werewolves total, and about 900 million cockney sparrows with guns. Presumably werewolves aren't suited to cover-based combat because they can't hold a gun and are easily lured out of cover through strategic use of begging strips. And speaking of wrong impressions, in the run-up to release I'd gotten the idea that the Odor 1886 was a four-player co-op shooter, going again by the teaser and the four characters on the box art arranged with equal prominence. I wonder if that might once have been the intention, because of the three characters on the box besides Galahad, none of them are still participating in the plot by the final level, as if in the original first draft they were supposed to have been tagging along with you. Although having said that, the main villain is also no longer participating in the plot at the end. To go back to the Advanced Warfare comparison, it's like if Kevin Spacey just flat out hadn't appeared in the final mission, and the final boss fight was instead with Kevin Spacey's pet Staffordshire Terrier, with Kevin Spacey mockingly saluting from a hang glider with sequel hook written on it. It definitely feels like a game that's been heavily cut down, because way too many characters and concepts are fighting for space to tie up their loose ends, and after the dust settles we're left with a game chiefly about humans shooting humans, and the supernatural elements end up as mere MacGuffin, an utterly vestigial element that could have been replaced with anything. The set-piece encounters with werewolves are blatantly similar to the fights with the hunter monsters from Dead Space, just to further illustrate that games being raggedly Frankenstein together from chunks of disinterred corpses is now near enough standard practice, and could easily have been swapped for sequences in which Galahad attempts to navigate a darkened room without bashing his shins on a coffee table. Now I think I know how to sum this all up. The Snorder 1886 feels like a launch title, something utterly dull, carefully assembled from only the smoothest inoffensive pieces, with no ambition beyond showing off the graphics tech and being just about playable to an audience as broad and homogenised as a kiddie pool full of watery soup, a game from the awkward earliest phase of a console's life before anyone had gotten to grips with it enough to try anything daring, doomed to forever haunt the pre-owned bin like the ghost of Banco within a matter of months if not weeks if not the five or six hours needed to complete it. There was a point in the game when I went the wrong way and found myself in a small dead-end room, empty of gameplay but thickly detailed with copper pipes, unused furniture and highly detailed crates, and I thought to myself how about we wall this room off, take all the effort that was spent on those fucking pipes, and use it instead to tack ten minutes of fun onto the game? A naive proposal, yes, but there was definitely something wrong with the priorities here. Perhaps it's that there was only one priority, and that was figuring out how to bypass the taste buds while trying to get us to swallow a cup of cold mung, milked from the barren flaps of an elderly sexually frustrated hippo. I review new releases and I occasionally do retro reviews, because it's nice to call on a spanking MILF now and again when you get sick of waiting for her overpriced daughter to download the latest handjob update, but these two responsibilities have been overlapping a lot lately with the current crop of remasterings, and mother-daughter threesomes always sound fun in theory, but I find they very easily turn weird. This week's subject is Zelda Majora's Mask on 3DS, a natural secondary heave for Nintendo to make after the initial chunder that was Ocarina of Time 3D, and as in that case I'd never played it before. I knew it by reputation, of course. When the Nintendo fanboys come at me for saying that Zelda games are samey and tooth and I'm forced to smash their heads in with a piece of bent rebar, the words Majora's Mask always seem to be written on the piece of paper they have instead of a brain. I did know that it had some kind of time loop mechanic that's supposed to be good, but I find it hard to believe that Nintendo came up with a good game mechanic that they have not since milked to oblivion. But I was pleasantly surprised by Majora's Mask. How a Zelda game usually works is that evil threatens the land in some unspecific manner, and then Link shows up all predestined hero-like, and the gods shower him with equipment and praise and ear massages, and he saves the people and resolves conflict everywhere he goes until his feet don't touch the ground and the sun shines out of his sexless pee hole. Meanwhile, Majora's Mask starts by taking that noble destined hero flushed with triumph from Ocarina of Time and kicking his fucking teeth in. A mischievous entity referred to as Skull Kid nicks Link's horse, turns him into a novelty bong, and gigglingly teabags his nose hole for a few minutes before running off to make the moon smash into a sleepy carnival town, successfully murdering the world. See, Ganondorf, this guy isn't even the cosmic predestined all-powerful master of evil, and he did a better job than you've ever done. He said, I want to murder the world, moon, smash, 
Bam. None of this swanning about on top of a castle, waiting for the hero to show up so he can try out his new sneer. But as we all know, the gods of Hyrule are nothing if not cheating motherfuckers, and so Link is empowered to repeat the three days leading up to the disaster until he can jolly well pull his socks up, de-novelty bong himself, and sort shit out. And I found this all rather appealingly cynical. I did the usual thing that I do, and gave Link a facetious name for my own bitter amusement, in this case useless, and this proved unintentionally kinda apropos, because while you do get to transfer your tools and songs from one time loop to the next, and your money if you remember to give it to the weird bloke who flops up and down like a circus seal in a headlock, everything you've achieved gets undone. So you do the usual Zelda thing and travel from land to land writing wrongs, usually in the form of a dungeon boss who was leaning on a big lever with make surrounding area shitty written on it so everything unshitties after they die, but the situations don't stay unshittied when you revert back to the start of the time loop, and all you can do then is leave them to rot. I only unshittied the Goron lands a second time so I could win the races and get the sword upgrade, a rather mercenary attitude for a destined hero. I hate when Zelda games try to characterise Link, aka useless, aka snot hat, because as we all know by now with the exception of Wind Waker Link, he has no personality. He'd be played in the film by Orlando Bloom. I particularly hate when female characters have the hots for him. I don't know what the fuck signals these women think they're getting from him, because he's got the expression of an untuned TV set. That's still the case in Majora's Mask, but it takes probably the best approach possible for an uncharacterised main character. Everyone barely registers his presence, they don't expect him to save the world, and many don't seem to realise it needs saving at all. He disguises himself as a Goron and a Zora at various times when he's saving their respective lands, and so his actions get attributed to whoever he's disguised as. Link himself ghosts through life invisible, a permanent outsider wearing whatever face he needs to gain trust so he can steal everyone's shit without even permanently fixing their lives. It's like Quantum Leap for bastards! So Majora's Mask appeals to me from a philosophical standpoint, but the gameplay has its niggles. Zelda games just can't seem to get the hang of this whole targeting thing, can they? Please focus on the massive monster that is the only feature of this entire fucking room before it knocks me on my ass. Doesn't seem like that unreasonable of a request, but the game would disagree. Also, Majora's Mask dates back to before the era of creepy hand-holding, and so the way forward can be rather obscure. I don't mind having to intuit a few things, but I'd like to know how it makes any kind of sense that I can't access the Eastern Lands until I put on the mask of a dead ninja warrior, which is for some reason in the possession of two flamboyant German porn stars who run the racetrack. And the time loop mechanic brings its own annoyances, such as having to sit through a character's introduction for the fifth time when you just want to buy a map without having to watch various wobbly bits flop around in a green leotard, like they're trying understandably to escape. I eventually became paranoid about starting anything if it wasn't still morning on the first day. The number of times I'd be most of the way through a dungeon or collected five of the seven sacred monkey bollocks, only for the moon to go, eh, you looking at my bird, and headbutt the planet Glaswegian style, sending me back to start all over again, but I suppose that's part of the fun. It's the whole point, really. You're not special anymore, useless. The villain's not going to be moments away from enacting their master plan for the next seven hours while they obligingly wait for you to hoover up gold sculptures. It's not terribly big for a Zelda game, and the ending can't help being an anticlimax. The moon goes away, life goes on, and no one seems to give a shit, but it's intriguing nonetheless. It's almost a metaphor for the futility of existence. You can work your sexy little elf boy gams off trying to make a difference, but in the end none of it matters, because chaos, represented by a prancing nonce with a diseased pineapple for a face will make it all for naught in the end. Or maybe I'm reading too much into things and it's just a cautionary tale about buying the right size green leotard. Playing most episodic games is like riding a roller coaster run by British Rail, where every time you start to get into it you're brought to a lurching halt for an unspecified amount of time so the buffet car can take on more egg sandwiches. My point is, if you're gonna start nicking ideas from television, nick one of the good ones, like putting out a little magazine every week saying exactly when the next episode of a show is gonna be out. I mean this is what kinda killed episodic gaming back when Half-Life 2 tried it. A cliffhanger's all very well, but if you're still hanging there six months down the line going, woo, probably gonna fall any moment now, it's kinda hard to sustain the enthusiasm. I mean I played the first episode of Life is Strange, and I'd like at least a rough idea of when the next one's coming so I can do enough research to figure out what the fuck language everyone's supposed to be talking. I mention this because I admire Resident Evil Revelations 2 right off the bat for having an actual release schedule, one episode a week for four weeks, let's all beam down to Planet Sensible. I'm guessing they can do this because they made sure all the episodes were basically done beforehand. Then again I could be wrong, as each episode does have a distinct thrown together in a week sort of vibe. This is a Resident Evil game, which in recent years have had less thought going into them than the average fart. Every Resident Evil game since RE3 has chosen its main protagonists by lining up the main characters of the first two games and throwing a dart. Do these people never age or do anything else with their lives? Has Chris Redfield ever made it all the way to the chemist and back without getting embroiled in zombie horror? Anyway, in this case the darts landed on Claire Redfield, Chris's sister from RE2, and Barry Buttons from RE1. They're part of a new humanitarian group called Terror Save, which has a long intro in the first episode going on about how nice they are and how you should totally trust them, so I'm assuming they'll turn out to be run by the Boston Kitten Strangler. I say assuming because at the time of writing I've only played three out of the four episodes. I can only speculate as to which non-playable characters 
Heroes will betray us before the end, I'll put an educated guess on all of them. I won't even waste the effort of trying to be engaged by these characters, not that I had a choice. The standard RE previous protagonist protagonist is capable as all bollocks and reacts to each new mutant monster with a concerned frown to disguise their stifled yawn, no engagement there. To balance this out, both protagonists are given a sidekick with a personality, in the way a blind person employs a sighted dog. Barry Buttons gets a mysterious little spooky psychic girl who it seems will tag along with literally anyone who acknowledges her presence for more than a second, while Claire gets Barry's daughter Moira, whose main character trait is that she hates Barry for no adequately explored reason. In fact, let's not mince words, it's her only character trait, but she makes the most of it, always taking the time to remind us that she hates her dad even while halfway past a demon's tonsils. Speaking of halfway down the tonsils, so far I've been mostly trying to make Revelations 2 choke on my balls, but there are things I like about it. I quite like the setup. The first half of each episode is Claire and Moira trying to escape from an island where the standard Resident Evil unaccountably smug cartoon villain has trapped them in a sadistic game of survival, and the second half is Barry Buttons, six months later, retracing their steps and trying to figure out how big a spatula he's going to need to scrape up his daughter. I think it's a pretty good format for building the intrigue. Would have been even more effective if any of the characters consistently acted like they were in horrific life-threatening danger rather than like they were, say, attempting to navigate a crowded wedding reception without running into their ex. It's also a surprisingly low-key affair for the series, at least compared to 5 or 6, although a shooting massacre in the Transformers movie's visual effects department would be a bit low-key compared to 5 or 6, but it's a small focus group of characters in an enclosed situation so it's managed to stay on the subtle side of absurdity so far. A helicopter crashes at one point and a factory catches fire but it felt so utterly token that it's probably only there for the sake of habit. Even the graphics feel kinda understated and a bit behind the times, to the point that I wouldn't be surprised if the game had originally been intended for 3DS like the first one was, and all they did was polish the textures up a bit, taking the environments up from shitty and uninspired to merely uninspired. The monsters are a bit over-designed, but you know the standard monster introduction cutscene where the camera swings around and getting a nice juicy look at all the drippy contours, before stopping at its face so it can roar at us like we just stepped on one of its carelessly strewn tentacle bollocks? That mostly doesn't happen, they're just kinda there. And even all four episodes combined will probably turn out to be a pretty short game, but pretty short also means not padded, and it's not like they're charging full price for it. No, the overall understated effect means Reveraven's Rue does very little that offends me, but that also means it never makes me sit up, uncup my balls, and take notice. I guess I kinda hate the crafting system because it's so token and has a strong we had to put this in because people expect it now vibe, like a Stan Lee cameo. I like the character switching in the Barry segments because his pet gnome can see monsters through walls but only Barry can kill them and that makes for an interesting mechanic, but I hate it in the Claire segments because it's just swapping out the gun for the torch. And it's the Doom 3 question again, don't see why we couldn't just duct tape the torch to the gun and just give the other character a nice thumb to suck while they stay out of the fucking way. I guess it's the fucking co-op focus they introduced in 5 and which now sticks to the franchise like gum in its hair, but I do appreciate that the different characters have different roles and astonishingly there's a split screen mode, which I will trumpet because lately gaming has been treating local multiplayer like the one old cucumber at the dildo party. So let's give it 6 strangled kittens out of 10, play it once then forget all about it, let it slip in and out of your mind like an image of your mother during sex. Video game developers have something in common with heavy goods vehicle operators and prostitutes who specialise in older clientele. It's extremely important that they know when to stop. Useful skill for all of us, in fact. It's a very sound and praiseworthy idea to shove Cadbury's cream eggs in your mouth, but when you find yourself shoving them in any other bodily orifices, you probably should have stopped before it got to that point. Similarly, the developers of The Order 1886 didn't know when to stop. Around the time of the earliest pitch painting, they should have stopped breathing and suffocated to death. Although strangely, they did know when to stop when given the many subsequent opportunities to drive straight into a traffic barrier and graciously end the blight that is their lives. And then you have the curious case of Hotline Miami 2, a game that when I finally got to the end I felt should ideally have stopped some hours ago, and yet at the same time it also didn't seem to have finished properly. It's the first of two Steam games I plan to get good and steamed up about today. Hotline Miami 1, The Phantom Menace, was a landmark in the field of pixelated gratuitous violence, a sort of dramatisation of the last ten minutes of Taxi Driver on Fast Forward, and what I liked about it was the surreal atmosphere and the ambiguous story that made the whole experience feel like a handful of brief moments of clarity glimpsed through the psychedelic haze of Rubik's Cubes and synth pop. Hotline Miami 2 makes the mistake of trying to be less ambiguous, it's like reading the book version of 2001 A Space Odyssey, learning what the film was supposedly banging on about and feeling unaccountably disappointed about it. It also attempts to suck on Quentin Tarantino's chin like the big rocket-shaped ice lolly it resembles by telling a huge ensemble story and switching between various protagonists. A group of vigilantes inspired by the first game's hero, a rogue detective, a writer, some gangsters, a fat bloke with a face like a baseball mitt that's been repurposed for sexual misadventure, a collection linked only by a mutual interest in running up to large numbers of bald men and mashing the left mouse button until someone falls over. The trial and error gameplay hasn't changed much from the first game, I'd say it was a copy-paste job, but it's seems to be a little buggier this time. It's not even hard to get a dude trapped clipping into a door, at which point you could harness the energy of his vibrations to power your home for a fortnight, otherwise it's the same ratio of one unspeakably violent victory for every 20 to 30 thousand unspeakably violent failures, which previously gave a sense of suicidal futility as the protagonist waded into yet another melee that gave him worse odds than a Shetland pony in a Gygax dungeon, but the same gameplay loses something when enacted by characters with ambition to survive past the next five minutes. The overlong campaign began to feel like a chore as we switched from one uninteresting character to the next until one by one they go through little 
arcs that don't have any kind of satisfactory payoff, finally ending in a confusing hallucinatory mess, presumably at the point the writer's house caught fire, and they hastily concluded the story with the phrase, and then everyone took drugs and died, the end. So if Hotline Miami left you hungry for more, Hotline Miami 2 will leave you very full and feeling rather sick and disappointed in yourself, and then it keeps going for a while until you're in the kind of food coma that you can only get out of with a taser gun. The second game we're sliding across the firing range is Ori and the Blind Forest, a fantasy Metroidvania platformer about a glowing baby cat rabbit thing in a dark forest for whom camouflage is just a thing that other people worry about. Let me say before we go on that Ori and the Blind Forest is a really beautifully animated game, with a very effective intro sequence that in a short time conveys the heartwarming friendship between our player character and their adoptive parent, and the gut punch tragedy when they die, leaving us alone in the world and forced to venture into the dying lands. So the question you must ask yourself is whether or not all of that is enough. Because once the actual game game started, all the goodwill I had from the strong beginning gradually dribbled away like jam in a drainpipe. I'm fully aware that it's acquired a certain acclaim, Steam doesn't hand out those overwhelmingly positive user review summaries to just anyone, like a free t-shirt, but accepting the animation department, Fern Gully in the Last Rainforest does very little beyond hit the lowest possible targets for the genre of arty platformer. Firstly, it's, you got it, a big-headed innocent cat-rabbit thing exploring a big scary world against a melancholy orchestral soundtrack. The plot is the usual restore light banish dark, which is exactly the same searing emotional drama that takes place when I launder my tea towels. The Metroidvania gameplay has the usual parade of movement power-ups, the double jump the wall, jump the barbecue bacon, jump with large fries. About the only new idea the gameplay offers is that you have to create your own save points at the cost of some of your magic power, but it doesn't take long for the cost to be negligible, and then you might as well crack off a save point every time you touch down, in the way Piers Morgan leaves a trail of oily handprints everywhere he goes. What annoys me about the gameplay is that it communicates entirely in the language of glowing blobs. Pick up the glowing blob, avoid the evil glowing blob that shoots glowing blobs, carry this glowing blob to the altar so that you can restore glow and blobbiness to the land. I feel sorry for colourblind players, they wouldn't be able to tell a missile from their own left bollock. I suppose I'm giving Ori Pori Pudding and Pie a lot of shit because I feel manipulated by it. I was being emotionally manipulated by the sad opening and I was fine with that. I like to give myself a good rigorous manipulation most evenings, but then at the ending they overreached and ruined everything. Ending spoiler warning, spoiler warning, hoot hoot, put it on mute. If you establish your game with a sad Bambi's mum death scene, magically bringing Bambi's mum back to life at the end makes all the goodwill slurp back inside me like a traumatic reverse child birth. We befriend a bloke and he resurrects our mum to do as a solid, but we never spoke to him so how would he know who or where our mum was? It's just conveniently engineered for the sake of most nauseatingly saccharine happy ending possible. When your plot establishes magical resurrection, all the stakes and drama immediately collapse. Where's the meaning in self-sacrifice if we can just get resurrected? Oh, the villain was motivated by her dead babies? Never mind! Pfft, they're alive again! Be more careful this time! Actually don't! Who cares? Here's three more babies! Fuck it! I complain because it undermines the emotional impact, you see, not because I'm psychotic psychotic and want everything to die. Not just because of that, anyway. Battlefield Hardline, I was ready to start facetiously renaming as Battlefield Hard On and Battlefield Harsh Reviews on Metacritic right off the bat, but I can't in good conscience use the title the game wants to have. A series that has always been war shooters suddenly becoming a cop drama isn't so much a step in a new direction as it is sawing our legs off and mounting the stumps on hover mowers, and slapping the Battlefield name on it feels a bit disingenuous. Almost none of the game takes place in a field, it's mainly a city or somebody's house, the battles are more like skirmishes, and it's not particularly hard. The line it can have, because the campaign is characteristically linear as shit, so with all that in mind, here's my review of Skirmish House Easy Line. Not that I want to discourage an attempt to escape the tired and toxic swamplands of the modern warfare shooter. It is very gratifying to see a Battlefield game with cover art that doesn't depict a soldier slowly walking towards the camera. They went for man-pointing gun this time, but a step is a step. Things didn't get off to a promising start when the first thing that happens in the campaign is you kicking someone's door in while a burly white guy says casually racist things, and I challenge you to find a single moment that more perfectly encapsulates the modern warfare shooter. But then we see just how much times have changed when you start arresting people instead instead of filling their faces with unwanted extra nostrils, and the enemies actually have the sense to put their hands up and surrender when a twitchy bloke with a camera for a face points a gun and tells them to. Yes, to the classic formula of shoot the nasty man or knock out the nasty man, we've added the innovative third option, arrest the nasty man, functionally identical to knock out the nasty man, but takes about three times as long. Although you do get more points, so it's not adding fun, it's adding another way for psychotic completionists to torment themselves. Well, drawing guys off and arresting them one at a time is a chore, but you can make it tense and exciting for yourself by attempting to arrest them three at a time, because you have to keep your gun on all of them in turn, like you're playing a hybrid of Russian Roulette and Eeny Meeny Miny Mo. The story campaign is surprisingly elaborate for a series that historically has gotten its mileage out of multiplayer, with an all-star cast of mocap actors rounded up from an L.A. Noir reunion, and seems to be making a concerted effort to offer a rebuttal, or rebuttal field if you will, to all that racism that underlay most contemporary war games like a cake platter made of frozen sick, almost to the point of going too far in the opposite direction, I'd say. While you muscle your fair share of disenfranchised immigrants, all the major controlling villains are as white as the polar bear 
suburb Yukaki shoot, there's even a chapter where you take on a militia of redneck assholes with the Second Amendment firmly wrapped around their shriveled vestigial cocks, which strikes me as terribly ungrateful to the demographic who were keeping the Modern Warfare shooter afloat up to now. Meanwhile, the main character is Cuban. I think. I picked up subtle hints to that effect after they brought it up seven million times, and by the end of the game he's assembled a little Scooby gang of allies so perfectly ethnically diverse that they could all line up in order and start a novelty act called The Amazing Human Gradient. As for the actual plot, well why don't you fill in the blanks yourself? You're a cop on the blank, you get blanked for a blank you didn't commit, and now you're out for blank and to clear your blank. The new modern shooter is officially the old detective thriller, with gradual shifts to heist movie in the second half. What confuses me though is that even after you've been wrongly accused and are on the run, you can still arrest people. In fact, when the evil private cops show up to arrest you, you can arrest them back. What organisation is going to come around and pick those guys up? The criminal police from opposite land who give talks to high school kids on how drugs are really great and everyone should take them? The campaign gameplay is kinda token. The difficulty settings don't change much more than health and enemy gun damage, and that doesn't come up much if you take the sneaky arrest people route. It does the Far Cry thing, where you can find a vantage point and mark targets, but they appear on the minimap whether or not you do that, complete with visibility cones, confirming my suspicion that they all have the eyesight of a myopic cyclops with a surfboard nailed to each ear. Can I be honest with you, AAA action games? I'm getting kind of bored of the Predator thing. It's every bloody game now. Sneak up behind, wait for them to drop the soap, instant takedown. I know it's about letting us choose our gameplay style, but I always feel forced to take the sneaky option when it's available, because I always get a sense that the game is faintly judging me otherwise. Be Bulletstorm or be Thief. There's something terribly undignified about trying to be both at once. I feel like you can aspire to be the world's best sprinter or the world's best weightlifter, but when you surgically attach a sprinter to a weightlifter, then neither of them are going to be bringing their A game anymore. And besides, Battlefield has much clearer ambitions when you switch to multiplayer. It's back to good old shoot everything with two legs that isn't an ironing board. And then ten minutes later, get told whether or not my team won or lost, which meant precisely dick to me, because I'd only been concentrating on staying alive for more than two seconds in a miasma of shouting and violence like the foxes were holding a rave in the hen house. I did rather enjoy the Hotwire multiplayer mode, which is based around driving vehicles. It was much easier to comprehend the sheer number of players on the server when they were all piled into vehicles, waving their willies out the passenger windows, but the need to drive around fast emphasised the relative smallness of the map, as people were constantly going out of bounds. God knows why they didn't just put a big wall around everything, because there's nothing worse for the immersion than driving innocently down an open road and the game suddenly going, INDEPENDENT THOUGHT DETECTED, CALL THE FUN POLICE! I enjoyed it, but it was so utterly removed from the experience of the single player campaign it felt almost surreal that the two were ostensibly parts of the same game. Surely the campaign should in some way prepare you for the multiplayer, but all that arresting people did me a fat lot of good when Triple X Wolf Nobbler Triple X was bearing down. I even unconsciously pressed the arrest button at one point and found myself throwing a grenade, which in the single player had been conspicuous by their absence. A grenade is the exact opposite of arresting someone. Arresting someone involves swiftly making an intimate new friend. Grenades involve swiftly losing one, along with everything below your waist. I think it's fair to say that a beach resort on the dark side of Mars would have an easier time making its money back than a lot of AAA games these days. Seems like there's only two options, you can either make something with such broad mass market appeal that it could only possibly offend lunatics who get triggered by pre-animated takedown moves because they were a neck in a previous life, or you do one specific thing so well that the people who are into that have no choice but to come to you for it. A business strategy that works for both three-legged dwarf gigolos and From Software who have been doing one specific thing for about four games now. Fortunately it's a thing I'm into because I like explorative metroidvania style gameplay, I like subtle storytelling, I like banging my head against a wall with a scary monster drawn on it, and most of all I like being incredibly depressed by the inevitability of death and lifelong suffering that will probably come as a result of banging my head against a wall. From Demon Souls to Dark Souls to Dark Souls 2 to Bloodborne, same shit, different anus. Bloodborne is Dark Souls after running all the text through the find and replace a few times, and the first challenge for the seasoned Dark Souls veteran like myself is figuring out what they renamed everything to. Estus is now Blood Vials, Souls are now Blood Echoes, Titanite is now Bloodstone, something of a pattern emerging here. It's all blood all the time, it's like that time of the month at the all-female gladiatorial arena. This is normally the point that I'd attempt to summarise the plot, but since my time machine is in the wash I haven't completely finished the game or gone through the whole thing with a team of archaeologists yet, so all I can say for certain at this point is that you're a chap or chapess in a slightly pre-industrial fantasy London full of angry townsfolk and werewolves, and your goal is to explore places and murder things until the game tells you to stop, and there's something to do with a nightmare that makes things turn increasingly surreal until you're mainly fighting twisted monstrosities with four bums for a face, which I personally have had nightmares about since the day I got trapped at the bottom of an orgy during a stomach virus outbreak. It's interesting to note that Dark Souls was about fighting dudes in armour and the odd malformed grotesquery with seven bollocks for a neck, and Dark Souls 2 went on to be mainly just about fighting dudes in armour, so appropriately Bloodborne takes the divergent path and becomes mainly about fighting smashed together abominations with eleven vaginas for a shin. There's a wet, filthy, diseased overtone to the aesthetic that reminds me of a 7-Eleven sausage roll, but design-wise I'd say it's closer to Dark Souls 1 than Dark Souls 2 was. Dark Souls 2 went mostly for linear open areas with one entrance and one exit, while Bloodborne goes back to the maze-like environments that twist around and loop
loop back into themselves appropriately enough like a handful of old tripe, with the starting city being most strongly reminiscent of the undead Berg from Dark Souls, if a touch more unintuitively laid out, if you can believe that, frequently raising the familiar Dark Souls feeling, thank fucking Christ I found a dead end at last, now I can try one of the other nine routes I discovered on my way here right after I investigate this innocuous looking pile of dead crows. Ah, get off, get off, get off! As is always the case with the From Software game, for there is only one, the broad strokes are the same but the nipples have been tweaked. The combat might be the plumpest and rosiest one, there's a gun now, which introduces the concept of riposting attacks without having to take a meaty biff to the mush if you miss the two nanosecond window. Shielding is out but you get health back if you hit them right after they hit you, favouring the frenetic girly slap fight over the cautious approach, and you'd better get slapping because you don't fill up your potions at checkpoints anymore. That's fine when you're in one of the areas where enemies drop health potions like they're on their way home from the health potion keg party, but if you're not, and are in full bang head on wall mode trying to get past a boss, then to have the best possible chance, then every few tries you have to go back to a previous area that is now so beneath you it can only be picked up by deep sea geological surveying, and beg the locals for health potions like a big issue seller with a halberd. I don't play the From Software game to stop banging my head on a wall for a while, I want to bang it again and again, feeling it break a little more each time before victory finally comes and I can go to the accident and emergency. And if they're gonna patch the game, at all. Here's a big fat suggestion that can sit at the top of the priority list like your gran on a stripper's pole. Please let us warp from any bonfire or lantern whatever to any other bon lanfire turn. As it stands you have to warp to the little green room between worlds before you can warp anywhere else, so if you're doing a lot of warping around exploring or scrounging potions then you have to go through two loading screens to get anywhere, and the loading times are almost unforgivably bad. I've been staring at the game's logo so long I can see that patchy wedding invitation font every time I close my eyes. It's almost deal-breakingly obnoxious for the game model that lives by the motto, if at first you don't succeed die, die, die again. Still, at least we can take solace in the fact that this will never be fixed because Sony gotta have their fucking exclusives. If there were a PC version, we'd know if the loading times were shit, there'd be something we could do about it. Buy better hardware for our rig, feed it chocolate truffles, but that loathsome little plastic cunt under my TV wants to keep the From Software game away from his old friends like a bitchy fiancé. Maybe the loading times wouldn't be so long if certain things weren't so bloody over-designed. A user message could no longer just be a simple orange sprite that's easy to spot against murky backdrops. No, now there must be little dancing skeletons all around every single one, popping off champagne corks as the words are inscribed in gold dust on the midriff of a virgin. I'm guessing this is someone's idea of next gen. It's odd because otherwise the model's been fairly streamlined, no equipment load, not as much variety of weapons and armour, although you can bling up your weapons with gems. Sorry, blood gems, how could I forget? On the whole, while Bloodborne is a huge game, the standard From Software model is plonker-tuggingly huge game, so that's a step back if anything. I like it more than Dark Souls 2, the twisted atrocity boss is much more visually interesting than the dude in armour boss, but how many times From Software are you gonna fall back on monster made up of multiple bodies smashed together. It was cool when Castlevania did it, now it's getting old. It just makes me wonder if the bodies ever argue over who has to be the arse. It was one of those troublesome weeks for finding something to review. The habitual drunkard that is the release schedule belched up the last of its latest round of rancid gut butter and has rolled over and gone back to sleep as we awkwardly hold the bucket and wait for the next tremulous stomach gurgle like a nest of baby birds. I was gonna do Pillars of Eternity, but after I rolled a character and went through the prologue I walked out into a meadow and was immediately slaughtered by a small group of wild piglets. I'm not sure I'm on the right way wavelength for that kind of game, although I did start enjoying myself later when I was reading through some conversational texts and was suddenly magically transported to a dark thorny forest full of gigantic monster crabs, but then I realised that I'd actually fallen asleep from boredom and my face was resting on a 1970s issue of Mayfair. So instead, let's do what I usually do when current releases are letting me down, let's get ret. Row. After all, you can't polish a turd, but you can at least reminisce about the lovely pine chips it used to be. It's not hard to find relevant retro games since remakes, remasters and updates are constantly raining down upon us like someone planted landmines in the graveyard. Half-Life 2 was recently updated with the imaginatively titled Half-Life 2 Update, a community-made mod that improves the graphics in such a way that you probably wouldn't notice without a side-by-side -side comparison. But hey, graphics are like public toilet cleaners, you know, they're doing their job properly if you never notice or think about them. The update also adds commentary not by the original developers, but by quote, members of the Half-Life community, and forgive me if that feels a little presumptuous. Bob the Stinky Tramp is technically a member of the community, but I wouldn't ask him his opinions on local government. The thing about fan commentary is that it's pretty much always going to be cheerleading, because that's what defines a fan, whereas the developer ten years down the line might have some interesting self-criticism with the benefit of hindsight. 99% of creators claim to loathe everything they made more than five years ago, and the remaining 1% are liars. So with the occasion of the update, let's see if Half-Life 2 holds up. Half-Life 1 did, the last time we rode the Retro Metro, but Half-Life 2 isn't quite the same vent full of space crabs. After escaping the research facility and defeating the leader of the alien invasion in Half-Life 1, Gordon Freeman has a well-deserved lie-in for the next 20 years before finding the Earth he fought so hard to save double backs he reconquered by an even worse alien race, and the struggling human resistance now considers him to be Specky Jesus. God knows why, when none of them actually saw him blow up the alien leader and most of the rest of Half-Life 1 was spent gunning down American servicemen and failing to rescue scientists. Also, the leaders of the Earth resistance all used to work with Gordon at Black Mesa 
Eraser, as did the human overseer of the occupying aliens, which is the kind of extraordinary coincidence that can only be explained by writers trying to force continuity between what could have easily been two completely unconnected plots. But I suppose it wouldn't have been the same without Gordon Freeman. It's not like players would have accepted any other mute, personality deficient goof allegedly lurking behind the first person camera. Old games that in their day sold themselves on groundbreaking tech usually now come across as kinda quaint at best, kinda Quake 2 at worst. Half-Life 2, surely it would be a full life then, was most notable for its groundbreaking physics engine, and if there's a single word that summarises its approach to physics it would be TADA! In this day and age, when physics engines are just another old toy cluttering up the playroom of the most hideously spoiled child to have ever existed, improved physics engines at that, where everything doesn't feel like it's made of vulcanised rubber and characters don't ragdollize like their bodies have spontaneously transformed into overcooked pasta. One might reasonably wonder why we have to pause in the middle of a daring escape through enemy infested tunnels to pile some bricks onto a seesaw and jump off it onto a ledge when we could just do a single pull up. The exciting airboat chase has to break flow three or four times because we have to disembark and figure out a Rube Goldberg machine someone set up to activate a ramp that could quite easily have been constructed from two planks and a fat person. And the other new tech the game is very keen to showcase like a weirdly chippy roommate humming and skipping around the house desperately hoping you'll ask how his date went last night is facial animation. To that end, we're occasionally locked in a room for lengthy story sessions that just barely escape being tarred with the cutscene brush because we're still free to climb on the furniture and jump on people. Certainly the facial animation is good and the characters are well rounded, but there's something kinda off about them. Maybe it's the way they remain so weirdly chipper while the oppressive regime is murdering people next door, or how their enthusiasm never wavers no matter how many times Gordon never speaks or visibly reacts. This was fine in Half-Life 1 when the cast consisted of 90,000 clones of the same five guys, but when there's an emphasis on individual characters and their interactions, the silent protagonist feels weirdly out of place in the middle of it. It feels like everyone's acting at him, you know what I mean? Like he's a casting director in a restaurant and they're a waiter with big ambitions. But now that faces rarely need to animate much beyond a grim determined frown and physics engines are largely used to make bits of grit realistically fly off of chest high walls, don't you think that the wonder and creative spirit that tech was intended to provoke has been lost? It wasn't just that Half-Life 2 Episode 0 had physics, it was that the gameplay made it work. The whole game is a series of showcase set pieces linearly strung together, but at least it had something to showcase. Most action games have physics engines now, but precious few have a mechanic as simple and gratifying as the gravity gun to use the physics to its full potential and give the world a sense of true interactivity. Many admittedly have better endings, where the story doesn't just screech abruptly to a halt because it's run out of set pieces, with two more episodes bolted on after the fact that end on a cliffhanger that goes unresolved forever, thus earning a permanent benefit of the doubt, well fucking played Valve. Is Half-Life 3 taking so long because you need to think of another innovative thing to showcase in it? Why not start with a ladder that it's possible to detach from without breaking both your legs? You know what I miss from the olden days, by which I mean two years ago? The Xbox Live Summer of Arcade. We had a little ritual of the Xbox 360 and I, where they would parade a little handful of indie games around with a bit of pomp and ceremony, and I'd take them one by one and grind them into the dirt until they cried. How we laughed. Those times are over now, because even if the Xbone did something similar with a new fistful of indie games like an unwanted bucktooth child with an oversized dented head smashing action figures together in his urine-drenched sandpit, it just wouldn't be the same. Maybe because the new console generation's entire purpose in life is to convince us that the ability to make shiny graphics a whole 10% shinier means it is their solemn duty to throw all previous gaming history in the bin and start afresh with an interface that has been shitted up to competition standard. So what of the indie games that are coming out exclusive to the new generation of consoles? Let's review a couple before the revolution comes and they're dragged out into the street to be shot alongside their Aristo masters. First of all, Axiom Verge on the PS4, a Metroidvania shooter platformer that takes the Shovel Knight route of accurately reproducing the NES style in all its low-res vibrant primary colours bleepy bloopy headache like a cold power drill right between the eyes glory. And there's something particularly obscene about playing a retro style game on the PS4. Is like eating Cocoa Pops with a spoon made out of the papal ferula. When I say Metroidvania, that's with a huge thunderous Metroid and a tiny vestigial Vania hanging off it like a small dog with its tail caught in the wheel arch of a speeding van. The story follows a young scientist named Trace, named after the thing that the developers did to Metroid to create this game, Hardy Ha, who gets caught in a lab accident, and you know how it goes with lab accidents. Heads you gain superpowers, tails you get transported to a mysterious other dimension. In this case it was tails, unless the incident also gave Trace his absurd sideburns. His quest is to save the alien world from an encroaching blight that intentionally resembles any NES graphical fuck-ups, but this problem won't be solved by punching the little brother who spilled orange juice on the cartridge. Axiom Verge doesn't just wear its Metroid influence on its sleeve, its sleeve is Metroid, because it killed Metroid and put on its skin. Personally, I've always preferred Vania to Metroid, because the latter is more about dull, claustrophobic environments where the scenery is a higgledy-piggledy mess of tiles even before the graphics fuck up, and the most you can hope for as you move from area to area is for the colour scheme to change to a different hue of eye-gouging vibrancy, and I hate the way secrets are so often hidden behind single tiles, all equally as out of place as every other tile in the wall, until you just 
have to systematically bomb all of them like you bought an advent calendar on December 23rd and need to get it up to date. Axiom Verge apes a lot of Metroid's mechanics but grants them somewhat more expedience. For example, instead of bombs, they give you a giant fuck-off drill, which immediately gives you the starring role in the wall version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You have a smaller form for navigating narrow passages like in Metroid, but you can throw it to hard-to-reach places instead of having to muck around with fiddly bomb jumps like a fat swimmer trying to propel himself with farts alone. And the sameness of the environments meant that after a while every new power-up meant I had to explore the entire map again to find all those hitherto sealed off passages I couldn't precisely remember where I'd seen, like a tour bus driver with a busted GPS. But I'd say the game's fun enough to compensate. Exploration is one half of Metroidvania's appeal, the other half is going back to where all the starting enemies bullied you and took your lunch money, and appointing yourself the god of death with your new overpowered weapon. Thinking of you, lightning gun. Axiom Verge delivers that, so while it has a lot of trough to go with the peak, and the aping of Metroid is so shameless as to be almost respectable, one of the games in the two-for-one review has to be the good one, so I might as well give it that. So let's move on, now that I've completely given the game away, to Stealth Think 2, a game of clones. It just came out for Xbone and Pisspoor, and eventually Steam, although apparently it's been on Wii U for a while, which I suppose explains why I haven't heard of it until now. And yes, it's Metroidvania again. If Axiom Verge is wearing the skin of Metroid, then Stealth Think 2 has done something similar to Abe's Odyssey. Or at least wants to, but only got as far as rubbing its shin with a blunt potato peeler. You are a small cloned midget in a large corporate facility who was created to be murdered for unspecific testing purposes, and must go through numerous puzzle-esque challenges to escape while saving as many of their fellows as they can. This is one of those games that I realised pretty early on I don't like, but can't put my finger on any one major reason. Perhaps it's the complete absence of stakes. Rescuing clones feels like rather an empty gesture when they're so evidently disposable. We could just find the clone machine, stick the outlet pipe out a window, and hold down the lever until we've rescued as many as we feel like. Or perhaps it's the graphics that put me off, which despite high resolution, full range of colours and 3D model characters, somehow manages to look flatter than Axiom Verge. Stealth Think 2 reminds me a bit of Talos Principle, with its sectioned off puzzle areas and its wearing of the increasingly threadbare I want to be portal hat that the games industry has been passing around for years, and the weighing down switches and laser beam puzzles the games fall back on when they can't think of a core gameplay mechanic, except in this case they did, and it's right there in the title. Stealth. Visibility is indicated by the colour of our character's eyes, and then it's indicated again by some off-putting text across the middle of the screen, because apparently a message has to be drilling its way into our very bones before our dunderheaded minds can detect it. And then, stealth forcefully established, the game becomes mostly about weighing down switches and laser beams, as well as obnoxious trial and error death traps as a timer counts remorselessly overhead so that at the end of the level you can see how well your time compared to that of several people who, if they sat opposite you in a food court, would cause you to feign taking the keenest interest in a sandwich ever experienced by man. And all throughout, the villain is sending you text messages calling you a twat. This is beyond antagonising the player, this is players murdered our parents and this was our last chance for revenge. And you know, even with the text messages I was still rooting for the villain. He wants to murder the protagonist so he can be employee of the month. It's not much of a motivation, but it's the only one anyone seems to have. Hell, I'm playing as the guy and I'd murder him just to jump the queue at the vending machine. Netherrealm, why you always gotta make me hit you? I'm mainly interested in narrative design, all you have to do is not have a story mode and we can leave each other alone. Smash Brothers figured that out, and now I couldn't give two squirts of frosted cum for what they do, but you and your fighting games just don't feel complete without a story campaign and then I have to play through them, the way I play all fighting games, by slapping the controller against my armrest with one hand while reading a book with the other. You're letting yourself down because when I talk to my friend who's into fighting games in his brief moments of lucidity between medication trials, he says your fighting games are pretty good as fighting games go, but you remain to storytelling what a man with bollards glued to his hands is to pottery making. We knew that from Mortal Kombat 9, when you sensibly rebooted the series to remove all the tangled bullshit that was the series canon at that point, and then proceeded to put all the tangled bullshit straight back. And with MKX being a direct sequel to that, we can expect it to entwine a few more cow pads before this day is out. Considering that most fighting games these days are built on more heritage than the fucking Merovingian dynasty, I'm surprised by how many original characters are introduced in MKX. There's even a gay one, apparently, and it's not the one dressed as a cowboy, which I call a fucking missed opportunity. Original might be a poor choice of words, actually. One of the the new characters is blatantly Master Blaster from Mad Max 3, and most of the rest are the younger offspring cousins and catamite love slaves of the returning old farts. I remember saying about MK9 that it was written like a subpar superhero comic trying to earn a tax rebate on Red Ink, and that comparison's only getting stronger now that everyone's got a fucking teenage sidekick. The trademark extreme violence feels rather incongruous combined with this whole Muppet Babies concept. You can play the story campaign and watch Johnny Cage complain to his ex-wife Sonya Blade that she never makes time for their daughter anymore, and then you can go into one of the non-story modes and watch Johnny Cage snap his daughter in half length ways like a giant Kit Kat. Anyway, the plot, such as it is, involves a big evil god of death type fella imprisoned in an amulet and everyone's really scared of him getting out even though the first we see of him he's getting his shit pushed in by Johnny fucking Cage. What follows is a textbook example of an idiot plot, or plot that only happens because every single character is an idiot. The necessities of the format mean that the game must be constantly contriving reasons for two characters to fight, but about 60-70% to 70 of the fights are founded on misunderstandings or pranks, so that after the fight ends the participants can be all chums again two dialogue lines later as the winner awkwardly helps stitch up the loser's gaping stab wound. 
wounds and picks up all the fragments of jawbone that blasted out of his asshole, it's also disappointing, having made up all these original characters, that the plot has to focus so much on all the shit ones. You don't even get to play as the sexy cowboy or master blaster in the campaign, and they were the interesting lads I wanted to know more about. I was pretty sure I could guess where Cassie Cage came from, Johnny Cage's sperms getting up Sonya Blade's cooch, although knowing this series she probably had to tear them out of his living balls and then they tunnelled into her pelvis with miniature hooks. As I said, I'm not the person to talk to about the mechanics of one-on-one -on -one fighters because my playstyle could be reproduced by dressing up the controller like a sexy girl dog and letting a hyperactive terrier have his way with it, but I do know this, fatalities are dumb. They might as well be renamed to formalities at this point. Back when you had to look them up in magazines, the effort gave them a certain spice, but now the game flatly tells you how to do them, they have become a pointless ceremony. The fight is already won, there's nothing more to prove, so we must dim the lights and rearrange the chairs and play a little fanfare so that the victor can pull apart a plasticine replica of their foe with awkward fake anger like they're the before video on an infomercial. So I like this new brutalities mechanic. How they work is, if you fulfil certain criteria during a fight and deliver the final blow with the right attack, one or more body parts will fly off as you do so. It's more of a challenge, it punctuates the fight without killing the rhythm, and more importantly, it's a lot funnier. I can turn to the loser and say, man, I really thought you had him right up until he punched you in the balls and your head fell off, but while it might be a legacy game, Mortal Kombat isn't above taking a few licks of the puke stain of modernity, and I have a few gripes under the heading of shit that I am under no obligation to use or acknowledge but which annoy me regardless. For example, when you start, you are forced to pick one of five player factions. You can complete special challenges to earn points for your faction, and whichever faction has the most points at the end of the week, uh is the faction with the most points that week. Thanks for trying to get us involved in a forced school sports day kind of way, but if you could imagine the penis of a mosquito brushing gently past a section of the labial folds of a blue whale's colossal vagina, that is how much of a fuck I give about my faction. Oh yes, and lest we forget micropayments. If those complex button combinations required for fatalities were providing the last quarter ounce of challenge necessary to make them the slightest bit satisfying, you can now get rid of even that by paying real money that your mum and dad had to work to earn to buy a limited number of easy fatalities. Perhaps next we could have shooters that offer to sell us bullets that aim and fire themselves, or perhaps just bung it a fiver to cut straight to the end credits. But while it's cunty to sell such things, it's even cuntier to pay for them. This is a two-cunt system, people, like a double-ended dildo, and I consider Mortal Kombat to be the lesser cunt in the scenario. No, the worst thing I can say about Mortal Kombat X is that its so-called high-impact violence has no impact whatsoever. You remember in the MK9 story mode that half the characters suddenly died in a plot twist as smooth and natural as a six-lane pileup? Well, in MKX most of them have been brought back as evil revenants, and then some of them get restored back to life after Quan Chi gets beaten up, and whoops, I think someone just pulled an Ori in the blind forest and introduced magical resurrection, thus performing a fatality on the plot itself, pulling out all the stakes like it's a still beating heart. The evil Shinnok conquers the earth, or at least claims he has, he just turns the sky red and I'm not convinced his plan went any further than that. The heroes show up, call Baxies and unconquer it, but who fucking cares, because even if they fail and die, apparently they can come straight back by strategically punching someone. Now we know why Johnny Cage was snapping his daughter in half, death has no meaning, so that's just how they discipline the kids. One infraction snapped in half, two infractions take the mobile away. I know it's against my usual principles to review the same game twice, but you know GTA 5 and GTA Online are only the same game in the sense that having sex with one half of a conjoined twin is technically a threesome. I never played the online component of GTA 5 the first time around, largely because my internet was down, and this was back in that strange dark age when you could play games without needing to be always online in case the game's publisher wants to stalk you. Besides, between Dark Souls and Battlefield I've been warming up to multiplayer lately, so I felt the time was right to indulge GTA Online for a week or so, and now at the end of that week I would like to officially declare myself cooled right the fuck back down to multiplayer, like a birthday cake stripper mistakenly delivered to Siberia. See, in Dark Souls, you know where you stand with other players. If they're white, kill a boss with them. If they're red, go for the backstab before they finish praising the sun. None of this nonsense where a mysterious car screeches to a halt nearby, and you have to decide if you're going to continue queuing for the ATM or preemptively pull your rocket launcher out of your jock strap. Please refer to my first review of GTA 5 for details on the actual game aspect, it's still the same sandbox drive aroundy shooty affair, with the same user interface that's so cool and minimalist you'll be too impressed to care that it's shit blisteringly awful at informing you that you've just been shot nine times, and are now one scraped elbow away from your ragdoll car wheeling into the sea. The one new gameplay feature introduced for the PC and next-gen consoles version in order to make it feel more like a remastering than a port, and therefore worth blowing another 70 fucking bucks on, is a first-person mode. So if you're having trouble figuring out where the guy is shooting you from, see if you do any better with your field of view reduced by about 45 degrees, and when half the screen is taken up by brickwork when you finally manage to persuade your character to take cover in a firefight. But wait, apparently there's a special money bonus if you complete all of the heists entirely in first-person mode. That's right, peeps, it's the gameplay 
gameplay feature so great they have to bribe you to use it. Incidentally, I only know about the glue camera to face bonus because I read about it on a loading screen. There wasn't much else to do in the 60-70% to 70 of gameplay time spent waiting for the game to connect to a mission or for other players to join, or for the game to cancel out of connecting to a mission because the host player dropped out. The number of times I had to reach for the iPad might as well rename it Grand Theft Auto Crossy Road. But once it's all loaded you're free to get stuck into some classic GTA shooting and driving action with the added fun of co-op gameplay. Once you've watched the long unskippable cutscene introducing it of course, and all the other ones during and after, every single fucking time you take part in a mission, whether you're initiating it yourself or joining a random game as a crew member, and you will be doing that a lot because A it's the best way to make enough money to buy an apartment that will let you initiate your own heist missions, and B the alternative is to remain bumming around the overworld with all the other sputter cunts getting into the occasional impromptu rocket launcher quick draw contest. So assuming you managed to get enough people to join your heist, and assuming they didn't bugger off during the intro cutscene, next you have to decide who's doing what, as the four members of the crew are usually split between different objectives. Often these objectives are completely unrelated and happen in different parts of the map. Doesn't that rather defeat the purpose of multiplayer gaming, when half the team might as well be on another server playing Counter-Strike for all you know? Except of course that all of you fail if any of you die. So you can drive all the way to your objective, making sure to beat your partner in a foot race to the driving seat, or that's another ten minutes of crossy road, and get most of the way through a gruelling firefight before the game goes, okay that's great and all, but the pilot just accidentally clipped a wind turbine while picking his nose, so we're gonna make you start it all over again. This is quite maddening, GTA Online, at least let us reassign the teams before we restart so that someone with opposable thumbs can fly the plane. Well you ever think maybe you didn't offer the pilots enough moral support while you were pinned down by enemy fire 17 miles away? It really does seem to be a setup specifically designed for making you hate random people, and it seems that a lot of the random people have realised that and decided they're going to own it. This is a game in dire need of a violent twat fumigation. I'd turn the voice chats on, immediately hear the word nigger and turn it off again. And then there were my experiences joining random races. I got into those quite a bit because unlike missions there was no chance of them abruptly restarting, because a player on the other side of the world fell into the Sultan of Brunei's crocodile enclosure. But I would counsel caution against joining a random race on a player design course, because every single time I did, it was some insane stunt challenge where you had to perfectly motorbike up a ramp and land on a carton of eggs floating in mid-air or something. 45 minutes I spent on one of those ones, because you can only rate a map once you finish it, and I'll be damned if the creator wasn't getting a thumbs down jammed down his throat until I could play Thumb Wars with his ghoulies. The last straw that made me stop playing outright and spend the rest of the weekend crushing bricks in my fists was when I joined a bike race and the host, a much higher level player, immediately closed the invites when I did so, and I quickly realised why. Your prior race performance is summarised to other players as 1x lost y, but annoyingly coming first is the only thing that counts as a win, regardless of how many players took part. I was reliably placing in the leading half of 8-16 to 16 player races, but since I wasn't coming first I might as well have been driving around in circles blowing raspberries and wanking like a chimp, for all the record would show. And Professor Dipshit here must have deduced that he could pad his stats with an easy win against this less experienced player. Well, I hope he felt cunning in the brief moment before I quit the race in disgust. See this is what happens when you have score tables in online games, it is a lightning rod for all the twat sanders who couldn't give a flake of dry jizz about gameplay and just want to cheat their way to the highest score because it makes their erection throb as it lays across their motorbike engine like a saveloy on a mailbox, if they're male, otherwise it makes their clitoris wobble like a jelly tot on a breville sandwich toaster. Blimey, I've been making a bad habit of reviewing games for the second time these last couple of weeks, but I'd argue that it makes sense for Broken Age. We might as well make an amount of fuss roughly equivalent to the amount of Kickstarter money that was sunk into it, and to that end I hired a team of royal buglers to play a suitable fanfare as I pressed the download button with a rhinestone encrusted glove on the end of a stick made out of all the money in the world. You'd think 3.5 million would create enough motivation to get the game done swiftly in one go, wouldn't you? Rather than released in two bits a year and a half apart, but what the hell would I know about adventure game development? And if you think that was sarcasm, let me know, because I haven't decided yet. Maybe the money was the problem, because I know if I'd humbly asked for a few grand to make a funny little adventure game and had ended up with 4 million, my first thought would not have been, wow I'd better make this game fast, it would have been, I'm just going to keep inhaling cocaine until you could put me in a paper packet and call me a sherbet dip dab. In the first instalment we had our two characters, Shay, the boy trapped in space with a hairdo that looks like a Kit Kat doing a Mexican wave, and Vela, a girl on a quest to kill the giant scrotum monster she was supposed to be sacrificing herself to. I'll drop a spoiler warning here in case you were too busy being the President of the United States to play the first half of Broken Face in the last year and a bit, but it turned out at the end that Shay's spaceship and Vela's scrotum friend were in fact one and the same, and the two protagonists then switched places for the second act. Shay running free in Vela's world and Vela nestled comfortably in Shay's scrotum. I'm going to keep saying scrotum until it gets a laugh, you 
you bastards. Consequently, most of the characters and situations in the second act we encountered before as the other protagonist, and a lot of the dialogue depends on us remembering them, which is a lot to ask after a year and a bit, and illustrates how splitting broken plot in half did it no favours. Still, now we know why the second part took so long, it takes a lot of effort to make no new rooms or characters whatsoever. That was sarcasm, I decided that time. The thing everyone knows about adventure games is that they're story driven. They don't hold up so well on gameplay because the gameplay is the equivalent of hanging out with the four fussiest eaters on the planet as you try to decide where to have dinner. But the story of Broken Nose I find lacking, largely because I struggle to describe what exactly the plot is about. I thought from the first part that it was a game about culture clash, the boy from the science fiction spaceship and the girl from the unspecific pseudo-fantasy world style arrangement type thing, connected by a mutual desire to escape and eventually getting trapped in the world of the other. But there is no clash. Neither hero has any difficulty adjusting to their new world, probably because there's only about three distinct personalities in the entire game and all the NPCs have to share. Eventually the plot becomes about a sinister scheme by an elitist cult to kidnap girls, a scheme that hinges on using elaborate stagecraft to convince a young boy that he's on a spaceship and then encouraging him not to do the thing that makes the ship kidnap girls, thus ensuring that he will do through reverse psychology. Who came up with this plan? Heath Ledger's Joker! The trouble with an intriguing mystery is that eventually you have to explain it, and the mystery can easily become dysentery. Maybe it would have helped if we'd actually seen any of this evil cult society type thing that orchestrated this extremely contrived arrangement, but I guess that would have meant more background art than the budget would stand, because when we do arrive in their headquarters we don't even get out of the ship, we just drop a big bomb and fuck off again. Hey, wanna come out and do some world building? asks the plot. Nah, replies the game, we'll just wait in the fucking car. Actually I think I finally determined what the plot is about. It's about how all the problems and adversity in the world can be conquered by bumming around on a ship. Vela uncovers the sinister global conspiracy while bumming around on the ship, and then foils it by bumming around the ship some more. Meanwhile, Shay's arc involves acquiring a list of tools and resources to repair another ship so that he too can unlock the power of bumming around on it, just in time for a climactic finale in which Shay and Vela realise their true potential as they engage in synchronised bumming. Wait, that came out wrong. As for the puzzles, it's more of the great adventure game chain of get the thing to give to the dude in return for another thing, the dude standing stock still in his designated spot who will steer all attempts at conversation to the thing that he needs. This reminds me of children's television. Hello Mr Fisherman, my name's Shay. Hello Shay, I'm a little bit sad. Why is that Mr Fisherman? Because I don't know how to fish. If only I could learn I'd be less of an inherent failure with a very ironic surname. Well then, let me give you this book about how to learn fishing. Thank you Shay, I'm glad we're friends. And then they sing a song about how much they like sharing. It's like all the NPCs exist purely mechanically, passive observers of the story rather than participants in it, each one assigned a role that begins and ends with temporarily obstructing the protagonist for no adequate reason. In fact, the final puzzle involves both Shay and Vela being obstructed by an ally and needing to construct elaborate distractions to avoid having to resort to speaking to the bastards. It's like me at a convention. I also want to get some special hate on for a puzzle I was stuck on for a while whose solution was to do nothing and wait. That shit's bollocks, and furthermore, that bollocks is shit. A point and click game drills into you from the word go that clicking on stuff is how things move forward. I have no reason to think I'm supposed to stand with a thumb up my butt waiting for the solution to materialise, if only because all the NPCs are fulfilling that niche quite adequately. Credit where it's due, though, the not untying puzzle was alright. And do you remember how in the first act it didn't make sense to let us go back and forth between the protagonists because they never affected each other? Well now there's one or two crossover puzzles where Shay needs information from Vela's environment and vice versa. It does, however, raise the question of how the characters discover this information in the context of the plot, unless all along this was the story of the founding of a new race of telepathic super spurgs. Without being able to read the developers' minds, I'd hate to make unsubstantiated claims that broken kneecaps was made up as it went along, or thrown together to fulfil an obligation, so let's just say that it bears an uncanny resemblance to something that was. What's that, Skippy? Wolfenstein The New Order is getting one of those standalone expansion type things? What good news. The New Order made it into my top five last year for adding some real depth to the act of cutting an endless parade of Nazi throats like we're a tiny lumberjack in the forest of squishy pink trees. What's that, Skippy? It's gonna be a prequel called The Old Blood? What good news. It comes before a thing that's new, therefore it's old. How heartening it is to see that id Software's investment in a dictionary is paying off. What's that, Skippy? Timmy's fallen down a well. What good news. This will give him ample opportunity to explore his interest in geology, and I can put a snooker table in his bedroom. What's that, Skippy? Kangaroo meat is a lean and tasty alternative to beef? Oh, Skippy, I already knew that, that's why I cut off all your arms and legs. Can you wriggle back down to the basement by yourself, or do you need me to kick you down the stairs again? Wait a minute, you extremely tasty marsupial git! A prequel to the New Order? What made the New Order good was that it was a kind of knowing swan song for the whole World War II action shooter thing. Yeah, it said, World War II is not giving up any more drops no matter how hard we ring it, let's just push it to the point of maximum absurdity, i.e. space Nazis on the moon, and make all the characters visibly tired and wondering why they bother anymore when they've been murdering Nazis like popcorn for 20 years and there doesn't seem to be any less of them. Surely to go back and set the game in World War II again misses the point completely. It's like making a prequel to Alien called Let's Watch Some Blue Collar Guys in Hypersleep for two hours. BJ 
Dave Blaskowitz, a man the size of a fridge who so embodies bullet-headed American military strength he might as well have George C. Scott's face tattooed on both his nipples, is on an undercover operation, possibly as a prank. His job is to find some documents that will lead to the mission in the prologue of New Order, which we already know he will fuck up like a ceiling-mounted fleshlight. On the way, he must foil a Nazi operation to exploit a supernatural power dug up from ancient times, which presumably will also fuck up because there's no mention of it in New Order. So what we have here is a bunch of predestined failures competing to see who can fail first, sort of like the British general election, but it does make it hard to stay invested. Besides, Nazis castle dig up ancient magic zombies is literally the plot of every Wolfenstein game before New Order, that is to say, before they got good. Nostalgia is a prevalent theme here, but New Order was turning that nostalgia around to go at it through a new hole. Old blood lacks the same self-awareness and goes back to the missionary position. For example, falling asleep and finding yourself in the first level of Wolfenstein 3D was cool in an easter eggy context, but Old Blood again misses the point by doing it seven more times. When you're locked into one of the longer and more boring levels of Wolfenstein 3D, all the surprise and impact is lost, but you'll gain a new appreciation for things like 3D models and colours that aren't either bright primaries or one of the two shades of grey the floor and ceiling used. Maybe that's the plan. The game locks us into these little retro sessions so that by the time we get out we're so astonished by the idea of one bit of floor being slightly higher or lower than another bit of floor that we forget how bored we were getting. Because Old Blood doesn't seem to have much in the way of aspiration beyond reminding us of things the New Order did better. One might argue that that's the point, we had the big tasty meal that was New Order and maybe some people came up and said more please, so now here's some more for those greedy fucking shitheads. Did you like that bit in the last game where BJ was in disguise and a high ranking Nazi started toying with him and you weren't sure if they'd sussed him out or not and things got kinda tense, in spite of the fact that prior performance indicated that BJ could probably just reach out at any time and snap all their necks using only his armpit. Well that happens again, twice actually. Look BJ mate, you look like Desperate Dan doing Schindler's List. I don't think practice is gonna make you any better at the whole undercover thing. Also, remember how the new order made you choose which of your two allies to save at the start and it changed a bunch of stuff throughout the rest of the game? That happens again, except it happens halfway through the game and doesn't affect shit. And I didn't know I was making a choice. I picked one of two corridors to go down and the next thing I know I've condemned the spunky resistance girl to a fate that she put up insufficient resistance to, ironically. Spunk notwithstanding. And all of that is buffered by a hearty feast of stealth and gun battling with fantasy tech Nazis, so there's your more please for all you slaves to the all you can eat deal. But I would argue that more please is what DLC is for, and that the standalone pseudo expansion is more the territory of more please but this time set it in hell, or more please but set it in a corny 1980s sci-fi film that would probably have starred Michael Bean, and then actually put Michael Bean in it in case we're slow on the uptake. The most old blood can do is introduce Nazi zombies, and in this day and age that's the fucking white noise of creativity. That's the fucking Jeopardy think music that plays inside the head of AAA game designers. Really fragile Nazi zombies too. I found the perk system, largely by remembering that New Order also had a perk system that it too was really bad at telling you about, and the zombies were really useful for getting all those unlocked, kill three enemies with one grenade, done, smash ten heads in with the melee weapon, just the ten, let's do fifteen for luck. I was perking up like nipples in a winter bra shortage, but it wasn't an enormous help when I reached the final boss fight, which is the point that the game officially lets its head slap onto the desk like a sack of wet laundry from the arms of a frustrated housewife. The Nazis raise a giant zombie king just in time for standard boss fight 27 alpha, upper half of large man smashing ledge where the player is with big fists. If Nazi zombies are the Jeopardy timer music of action games, this is the point where the music abruptly stops because you've been hit by a tranquilizer dart. Except it's traditionally the boss fight of the generic third person game where you have some kind of dodge ability to avoid the fists, and in first person it becomes a frustrating exercise in sprinting back and forth like a streak with a football match, hoping that the attack brewing somewhere off screen to the right will whiff if you keep moving, and things get even more annoying when Nazis start streaming in who for some reason prioritise shooting you over shooting the giant boss who smashes indiscriminately. I'm thinking these guys misread the orders. Gehen the boss fight, shooten the massive bloke, they read aloud. Did they mean the massive bloke or the incredibly massive bloke? It just says massive Hans, fair enough, die Yankee scum, ach not my German sausage. Good cyber morning to all you script kiddies and leet hacksaws out there, surfing the information superhighway like a bunch of fucking wankers, it's a special cyberpunk edition of the increasingly less occasional zero punctuation indie double bill, where we'll review two recent cyberpunk games featuring hackers that don't wear free t-shirts from defunct technology companies, or smell faintly of bacon, thus bearing a resemblance to real life hackers as close as the belt loops on a real life hacker's cargo shorts, oh shit. You know it seems like we've been doing the indie double bill thing more often lately because the indie market will probably be all that's left scurrying around the ruins after the titans of AAA finally reenact the end of Evangelion together. That was the mandatory cyberpunk dig at the 
the evils of giant corporate culture, keeping the free spirit of data exchange under the boot heel of the man. Assuming that the man are all men, of course, all the women in the man are obviously sterling and praiseworthy examples of diversity in the STEM fields. Anyway, let's kick off with Dex, a game about a young lady struggling to cope with life in the dystopian cyber future with what is A, a boy's name, that B, rhymes with sex. She's on a mission to restore some vast controlling AI that will wrest power from the corporations or some such rubbish. It's funny how adherence to cyberpunk, a genre based around futurist ideas of rebellion and non-conformity, so often themselves conform rapidly to cliché. Yes, it's a dystopian megacity. Yes, everyone who applies for a business license gets a free neon sign. Yes, the city's divided between the nice upmarket district where the man lives and the hideous slums where everyone with dreadlocks or a shaved head becomes evil and joins a gang and the rest of the population stands around staring at flaming barrels all day, trying to figure out what everyone else sees in it. And the main character has the kind of wildly unnatural hairdo you get from sticking your head in a 7-Eleven Slurpee machine. Now all we need to fill the cyberpunk checklist is a shitty hacking minigame, a faintly retarded futuristic Christ allegory, and at least one character named Decker. Bish, Bash, and Barnaby Bosch. Dex is of the indie school of thought that anything full 3D AAA games can do can be done just as well in 2D pixel art. In this case, the multiplayer style sci-fi RPG model of the Deus Exes of the world. An aspiration I could get behind, but while it's certainly possible to recreate Sydney Harbour Bridge in Origami, it'd take a braver man than I to drive an ice cream van over it. Multiplayer styles are difficult enough to balance even with three dimensions of wiggle room. When faced with an enemy combatant, for example, Dex can either punch them, each blow doing the same damage a timid squeaky fart does to a fresh pair of underpants, while their gun using friends somewhere off screen to the left freely picks off your health with perfect headshots. Or you can stand stock still, firing wildly with a gun of your own as the melee focused enemies take turns using your ass as a therapy doll, assuming you figured out how to equip the gun by moving it from one unlabeled inventory window to another unlabeled inventory window. Or you could just wait until they turn around and then sprint up and press one button to cuddle them into dream time, more often than not cuddle the space one foot to the right of them because the positioning fucked up. I had high hopes for Tyrannosaurus Dex after first impressions, but its attempts to juggle its ambitions becomes a struggle juggle. My annoyance grew each time I walked through a door and a camera saw me, an alarm started blaring and a turret started firing, all before the screen had finished fading in. My tether, it transpires, stretched as far as the scrapyard level, where after laboriously luring away a veritable dog pile of enemies one at a time for a struggle snuggle each, and then not saving the game, I walked blissfully onto a featureless section of ground and was instantly killed by a landmine. Well, Dex, as I once said to a member of staff at SeaWorld as they informed me of their policy on inappropriate dolphin contact, I know when I'm not wanted. So let's move on to our second game, the recently de-early accessed Invisible Ink, which I almost referred to as Stealth Ink for a moment there, but no, that was a different 2.5D stealth-based second half of an indie double bill review, with an uncannily similar title. Invisible Ink is a game prominently featuring a man with a sporty little trilby and woefully outdated fashion sense, so it's already got more hacking realism points. If you could imagine taking an isometric turn-based game, like XCOM, setting it exclusively in small rooms and tight corridors and where the objective is not to shoot all the aliens but to sneak up and give them atomic wedgies, then that's about the size of it. We are the controller of a secret organisation of infiltrators that's so secret it gets busted by the corporate cops like 30 seconds in and we spend the remainder of our time desperately trying to piece our resources back together before the arbitrary time limit runs out and something arbitrary happens. And on the whole, I like it. It does feel a little bit un-cyberpunk to be actually physically in the place we're hacking into, crouching behind a pot plant, but turn-based and stealth are a good match for each other as we have time to carefully think before we step out into enemy line of sight and try to figure out how many is an unacceptable number of shot-off bollocks. Things did start feeling kind of crowded after I secured a full party of four agents and the corridors weren't getting any less cramped. Two agents is a stealth mission, three is a crowd, the fourth might as well show up on a party bus with some lime wedges. In the final mission I had six bumble cunts trying to go unnoticed in the hallway. I ended up having three of them on permanent sit on a guard's face and keep queefing so he doesn't wake up duty. That's the point in the game where the plot, having been hurled away with some force after the intro, finally boomerangs back and hits us in the teeth. And on the whole, I wish it had had more of a presence throughout the intervening game. When the only two characters with voice actors are forcibly added to the party at the end so that they can do all the important plot stuff, rather than any of the guys who've done all the work so far who we've gotten to know, that felt like an imposition. Excuse me madam, we can't hear our fun stealth game over you contextualising. I say gotten to know, it might have helped if any of the colourful character traits our agents are attributed with in their bios were at all evidenced in-game. Like with some dialogue or a slogan t-shirt. Oh, this lady's a veteran hacker but is troubled by her conscience. Yeah, that comes across as she sits queefing on a guard's face in glum silence. You get a real sense of internal conflict with her every determined clench. And now your regularly scheduled reminder that the new consoles are shit. The new consoles are shit. Thank you. For further information, look at a new console and rub shit in your eyes. Yes, I got burned again. Let's just play Witcher 3 on PS4, I said to myself. From what I hear, it's supposed to weigh on the hardware like a monkey swinging from a pair of distended nipples and my PC's not the spring chicken she used to be. At least on consoles there's a certain guarantee of technical efficiency. It seems all that huffing compressed air had caused me to hallucinate that I was in some marvellous other universe where all sense hadn't stampeded out of the AAA games industry like a room full of young women when Bill Cosby walks in. So what followed was an epic tale of frame rate loss, long load times, weird glitches, stop floating 
putting two feet in the air, Mr. Dwarf. I know you're only trying to compensate. And one good old-fashioned infinite loading screen, during which my calloused hands groped in vain for my twin swords control and alt atop my trusty horse Delete. We return for the third time to the adventures of Rivery Gerald, a witcher, that is to say someone who hunts monsters, not witches. It's as needlessly confusing as ever. Why don't they just call it Monster Hunter? Th oh wait. Gerald is a master swordsman but can do magic as well in a cool casual off-handy kind of way, not like how all those nerd mages twat about with it. But his lot is a tragic one as he is shunned by ignorant society because he had to undergo mutation to make himself really good at everything, even though his only visible mutation is a pair of cool scary eyes, rather than anything disfiguring that might prevent him from macking on all the ladies who will want his beautiful white hair cascading over their hot titties like the foamy fast flowing mountain stream it resembles. Also, big muscles. There's something terribly wanky about all this. Gerald is one secret make out with Harry Potter away from being a self insert fan fiction character. Even more so now it's the third in a series of epic world changing adventures and so Gerald seems to be more personally acquainted with major political figures than a stray dog is with fire hydrants. It was annoying to have to flip to the character glossary every other dialogue because 90% of the named characters are from previous games and listening to their conversation was like escorting a new girlfriend to her high school reunion, but I was only annoyed because this is the first time I've actually gotten somewhat into a Witcher game. Previous games left me kind of cold in the way those kinds of complex western RPGs often do. I always feel paralysed by things that are too open, like your mum's legs. Am I going the right way? Should I loot all seven million lootable objects in every given room just in case I need to craft something later from a broom and a colouring book? Am I nobbing the most ideal of all the nobbable whores in this brothel? So Witcher 3 sat me down and went, alright fuckface, how about we spend the entire first chapter of the game tutorialising the bollocks off every feature we have, would that help his majesty settle in? Ride here, kill the monsters, craft that, punch these blokes, drink this, wipe that on your sword, wipe your cock off on a bedsheet, fight a griffin we have practically nailed to the floor for you, any fucking questions? Just one, why do you keep trying to make me play Magic the Gathering? Boring and weirdly omnipresent card game side quest aside, the combat is probably more layered than it needs to be. For most enemies, mashing quick attack and dodging aside when you see their monocles pop off with indignation will get you most of the way there. If a boss was proving hard, I'd just cast the Jedi mind trick stun thing for a free hit and then keep dodging until I could shake off my magical wankers cramp and repeat. Meanwhile, the game watched uncomfortably from the sidelines, occasionally shouting, hey, there's all these fancy oils you could be using to get this done about 0.4% more efficiently. Maybe you could craft some from the entire hanging gardens of Babylon's worth of random herbs and flowers you've got stuffed down your trousers. Got any upgrades for the basic healing potion? I shout back. Not presently, no, replies the game. Then I'll stick with mashing quick attack if it's all the same to you. Well, if that's your attitude, your sword just broke again. Ha 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 ha. Oh, bloody hell. Rivery Gerald's oaths of fidelity last longer than his fucking swords. I think they just stuck a hilt on an unusually long Pringle. The game's real strength comes from the storytelling, Gerald's Mary Sue tendencies notwithstanding. There is a bit of the old Bioware face, disconnect between words and gestures like a badly dubbed Polish soap opera, but the rest of the time the character's face and body animations seem just natural enough to be engaging, which probably means there must have been a soul-crushing amount of effort put into the fine details to avoid the classic Commander Shepard deer in the headlights look, and I'd like to personally shout out whoever had the thankless title of Eyebrow Wrangler, because I did engage with the characters and felt sad when my choices led to their deaths, although it's pretty fucking hard to predict where some axes will fall. One particularly nuanced character died as an eventual consequence of me turning an evil tree into a horse. Well, now it sounds obvious. It's the fine details that really makes Witcher 3 storytelling. A sequence that stands out for me is when you have an audience with a king, but are forced to have a shave and pick out a new outfit and learn how to bow first. A lot of games would have just gone, ride your horse through the front door, then mash the A button at whatever cunt's wearing a crown and an exclamation mark. The Witcher 3 example is all about showing over telling, which is probably for the best, because whenever anyone tells us anything, it's usually in an exaggerated regional British accent that turns even the most dramatic scene into Monty Python does Westeros. Nevertheless, I was getting into it, but I eventually found myself with a laundry list of side quests involving major characters that I did genuinely want to do, really, as I was fairly certain they would lead to getting to watch two 3D models awkwardly bump uglies like two sausage rolls trying to get past each other in a narrow hallway, but I was already past the suggested level for the next main quest and I don't like being too overleveled. The combat was already feeling like having to tokenly play fight every basket of puppies and none of them felt left out. I hadn't needed to hunt a monster in like seven levels, and it was nice to see Gerald on the job. There was something endearingly blue collar about calling on villagers like a travelling chimney sweep and tracking down the beast with a bit of CSI Narnia. So I'll give Witcher 3 my recommendation for the adept story crafting, but as the housewife said to the Randy Stallion, it's possible to put too much in. Reports are in that Haley's Comet has been sighted and appears to be making a trail in the shape of the winning lottery numbers, but in even less likely news, Nintendo has come up with an entirely new first party IP. I speculated in that lovably misanthropic way of mine that the decision to come up with new IP may be rooted partly in the protracted barrel scraping session Nintendo had to undergo to find enough characters to justify a new Smash Brothers game. But not only is Splatoon an original IP, it's also a third person shooter with online multiplayer focus, no less. Don't tell me someone at Nintendo actually opened a curtain for a second and caught a brief glimpse of the direction video games have largely been taking for the last 20 fucking years. Somebody stop them before they actually look out of the window and go into shock induced catatonia. Still, I th-ink. There'll be an ink, Reese, in the number of Wii U sales with this 
this ink readable new title. God knows why it keeps making ink puns though when everyone's very clearly throwing paint around, but that's hardly a complaint. Compaint. In a horrifying Waterworld-style post-apocalypse, humankind has been supplanted by a race of highly evolved squids who battle each other for supremacy amid the abandoned ruins of shopping malls, skate parks, and various other disused Saved by the Bell filming locations. But it's Nintendo, so obviously it's about as gritty as a cuddle souffle and has a very kids these days probably think this is cool aesthetic designed by people who haven't gone outside since the mid to late 90s. The online multiplayer focus is writ large as you enter the game world staring directly at the door to the online multiplayer, flanked on all sides by cosmetics and weapon shops that will shun you like a stinking leper until you're at least level 4. And speaking of stinking lepers, it's lucky Haley's Comet was in the sky because that meant my Australian internet connection would be able to hold it together for as much as a whole 15 minutes at a time. When it was, the matchmaking speed decisively smashed GTA Online into a copper kettle and did a poo on its head. Barely two seconds of crossy road went by before I was whisked off to join a server full of massively overleveled Japanese dudes. Nevertheless, it was fun. Obviously. Nintendo powderizes fun and snorts it off Kid Icarus's buttocks, probably because engaging the massively overleveled Japanese dudes in combat is less important than covering the most amount of arena floor with your team's colour. So while the three massively overleveled Japanese dudes on my team ran ahead to meet the enemy team head on, I'd stay behind with my big paint roller, because that's totally something you do with ink, isn't it? Put it in a paint roller and ink your living room with a lovely cornflower blue ink. Get your fucking story straight! And I'd cover all the little nooks and crannies that everyone else forgets about and frequently cement victory. Sometimes I'd see an enemy paint roller thinking they have a better idea what colour the floor should be, so I'd follow them closely behind without them noticing until they finally stopped to admire their work and get a big fat paint roller up their arse sideways until you could post letters down their distended anus. Ha ha ha. Yeah, it expands the area you and your team can move around in, so it aids the fun that way, but I also find something basically satisfying about painting a big space. It's like competitive tidying up. Which is not to say it's not chaotic, fast-paced fun. If it wasn't, getting kicked to the lobby when my connection died wouldn't have given me balls resembling the Blue Man group having a heated argument between my thighs. So what other online content is there? Other online content, said Splatoon, bemused. We've got a whole two maps. You can wear different shirts that no one besides you will ever notice or care about. What more do you want? Two maps? No, of course not just two maps. We wouldn't be much of a multiplayer focused game with only two maps, would we? We've actually got five maps, thank you very much, but we artificially restrict you to two and change them every few hours. Okay, why? What's with all the fucking questions? You see anyone else complaining? Said Splatoon, pointing to the many player avatars standing around the lobby like Village of the Damned, with Miiverse posts floating over their heads saying things like, This is the best game ever, and hooray for Splatoon, and my connection died again, whoops I mean I love Nintendo, and thanks to Nintendo and to local gaming retailer for bringing me this great game. That was a real message I actually saw. How many checks do you think that guy's cashing? Turns out, a big chunk of this online multiplayer focused game is a single player campaign. Oh Nintendo, you poor sod. Someone suggested making an online shooter and were smart enough not to stand on the trapdoor to the piranha tank, so you had to reach a compromise but you just couldn't fight the old instincts. What with the core gameplay essentially being the diametric opposite of Super Mario Sunshine, the single player does play quite a bit like a recent 3D Mario game. You complete a series of levels consisting of groups of floating platforms on which you complete a brief challenge, then rocket to the next group of floating platforms on a jet of magical diarrhea. Wow, I said as I was two thirds of the way through. I am really bored! It's not awful, it just feels kind of token really. All the levels blur together in my head and the slower platform stroke movement challenge gameplay seems to be reading off a different page to the chaotic third person shooty identity of the online mode. I liked the music in the online mode for one thing, but the single player campaign music sounded like someone took the Crash Bandicoot soundtrack and beat it to death with a Fisher Price piano. Each subset of levels ends with a highly Mario esque boss fight. Mario essent? So you know how that goes do a thing three times, then win. Until the final boss, which mixes things up with do a thing five times, then win. Which serves to illustrate why three times, then win tends to be the preferred model, because after laboriously beating it and watching the credit sequence where you spray paint to reveal the names in such a way that totally looks like you're urinating on them, I found myself suddenly feeling down on the game. What's important is that the core gameplay, spraying stuff on things and then swimming through it like a small barbed Amazonian fish up a stream of Wii, is inherently fun and well designed. Backtrack, backtrack, mollify, mollify. Everything else is trappings and finery, but as trappings and finery goes it's rather anemic. Maybe that's the sort of criticism that dates a review, after additional content gets patched in later, and perhaps I could interest you in my escort service where you pay 60 bucks to feed me crisps in the hope that I might decide to knob you at some point. I have an inkling that that'd be a nice little earner, or should I say ink l ink mother f -ucker. I know I don't usually use screenshots or footage of the games I review in Zero Punctuation because I wouldn't want anyone to get some misguided impression that I know what the fuck I'm doing, but I'm going to make an exception in this case and share with you my first impression of hatred. 
Yep, you can see what all the controversy was about now, can't you? That fiery orange text could cause some real emotional damage to a pyrophobe or an Irish separatist. Yes, Australia continues its valiant efforts to rescue its beer-swilling, thong-wearing, spouse-beating population from moral degeneracy, and I in turn continue to fight the power with daring guerrilla tactics like steam codes. Just call me Play Guevara. Here comes my attempt to break the land speed record by going from zero to totally minge-squirtingly obvious in just eight words. Try banny game, make people wanty game more. Hatred went straight to the top of the sales chart the day it came out, and you know damn well it wasn't for its innovative gameplay or its heartwarming love story about a combat boot trying in vain to reunite with a concrete pavement. Hatred's protagonist is quick to claim that his name is not important, although I feel the teen gossip magazines would disagree, so let's just call him Jeffrey Cuddle Trousers. Jeffrey has finally grown tired of people taking the piss out of his hairdo by calling him Madam at the checkout of the trench coat and death metal shop, and decides that weighing up all the pros and cons, the logical way forward would be to murder the entire world. So he emerges from his shack dressed for a Texan wedding and starts racking up the body count. You might call it a sick power fantasy, and I would reply, well yeah, that's why it's funny. I picture some spindly, angst-ridden teenager seeing something like this in their head moments before they burst into a McDonald's, drop their dad's revolver, and shoot themselves in the kneecap, and that makes me laugh. Am I a bad person? Yes, but not because of that. Maybe if Jeffrey Cuddle Trousers had had an ounce of humanity that could make him the slightest bit relatable, the game might have been disturbing. But I don't see how anyone could take him seriously long enough to be disturbed. With his cookie monster voice and his cousin Ed from the Adams Family hair, he was certainly certainly difficult to take seriously when I was playing as him, as he seemed to have the most tremendous difficulty navigating the hated doorways of this rotting so-called civilization because it's isometric. So while it does very effectively replicate the appearance of The Sims going through an awkward phase, it's not so good at making it clear where everything is in relation to everything else, which certainly isn't helped by the deliberate stark monochrome look, so interpreting the visuals can sometimes be like trying to read a Sin City comic that's been photocopied 12 times. A button to rotate the world might have been nice, and might have helped us figure out if that cop is shooting because he has line of sight on us, or because he's being tormented by a refrigerator that refuses to keep its hands where he can see them. Also, the concept of jumping over things is not something that I think should still be giving anyone trouble in the field of game design. I thought we had that down from Mario 1, but sprint at low cover to jump over it is the kind of design that leads to the headline deranged killer brought down while attempting to mate with Hedge. What might also have made the game disturbing is if any of your victims showed any sign of not wanting their skulls cracked like dog food piñatas. Sure, they scream and run away when they see Jeffrey Cuttle trousers, but when they all stand around in groups about 50 yards away like a herd of wildebeest, confident that there can't possibly be a lioness around anymore because there's all this long grass in the way. Don't think the shitty AI makes the game easy, though. Enemies with guns seem to be so offended by your piss-poor demonstration of kill crazy that they need to show you how it's done, and will start shooting before they're even in your field of view. So the best way to locate the enemy is to walk out into the open and see if you end up with more holes than the average clarinet. A large group of armed enemies becomes absolute chaos, and since enemy gunfire sounds exactly like your own, I kept running out of ammo and not noticing. So I'd be standing there pointing gun fingers at Sergeant Big Nuts, thinking, blimey, this guy's soaking it up, before realising the bullets were coming out of rather than going into him, and I now had Philly cheesesteak instead of a bottom half. Here's my pro strategy though. Start a big fire, then hide behind something on the far side of it and watch the entire highly trained police force enroll for Caveman Lessons 101. Fire, hot, ow. Nevertheless, hatred remains quite hard. In fact, it's an anagram of quite hard, with a QUI left over for when it's quitting time. BAM! I wonder if that's rather going against the whole revel in gleeful anarchy thing. Yeah, you can start off mowing down innocence at your leisure, but eventually the opposition will get stiff and you'll actually have to start thinking. Spree killers being well known for their sterling logic and forward planning ability. Could it be that Hatred is in fact a morally upstanding game in disguise, trying to teach us the important lesson that violence will only ever be met with more violence, as well as shitty AI and bad haircuts? Possibly, but then again this is a game where you execute people to regain health, so I guess it's also sending the message that stamping on an innocent person's head until it bursts is the best way to appease the little pixies who will come and plug up all your bullet holes with magic gumdrops. Hatred's short, but it's as long as it needs to be, that is, any length at all. Jeffrey Cuddle Trousers could have shot one guy and then briefly waved his bum around and the game would still be as long as it needs needed to be. It doesn't matter that the design's shit and the story's inane, because hatred isn't an entity in itself. It's the latest incarnation of the game that always appears when concerns about video game content enter the popular discourse. It was called Postal last time. We live in an age where mass communication has counterintuitively turned all attempts at verbal debate into a basketball game where the teams are on different courts and stand around the basket racking up meaningless points and throwing shit over the dividing wall. The only way an individual can safely express their politics these days is to anonymously spend money. Hence why homophobic pizza joints can mysteriously accrue a million dollars in donations. Hatred exists merely as a maypole for those wishing to defy the cultural nannies who want to tell them they can't have it until they learn to wipe their bottoms properly. So two groups of affluent middle class people annoy each other, hatred makes tons of money, and the world at large gives less of a toss than a quadriplegic shot putter. Good night! It's that magical time of year when marketing professionals throughout the games industry load up their shotguns and shoot a massive bleeding fake smile onto their faces to misrepresent a whole load of wank until we want to buy it and then tell us we can't have it until quarter four next year. Yes, the E3 hype train has pulled into the station for another year 
to unload a few tons of liquid shit onto the platform and then speed off cackling into the night, but as I write this introduction before the first press conference begins, I don't mind admitting to a quiet hope that things may be a little different this year. Perhaps they might even announce some things that haven't already been leaked. Also, VR tech may finally be making its move. The claim that motion controls would enhance immersion was always about as believable as the claim that a sledgehammer can enhance a Fabergé egg, but I genuinely believe that VR represents the way forward for immersive gaming. If they can iron out that whole, playing it for more than an hour makes my stomach want to crawl up my throat and file divorce proceedings against my inner ear problem. But of course, Oculus already did its pre-E3 announcement that it was jumping into bed with Microsoft. Yowza, could have broken that more gently, Oculus. You don't come out to your parents in a Christmas card, an Xbox One controller will ship with it like a rich snot buying his way into the popular kids club, and you can stream Xbox One games onto it. There was a video of someone playing a third person game on a screen in a virtual living room, which I'm guessing is their entry for the Piers Morgan for President Total Pointlessness Award, and also there's going to be a special two-handed controller that incorporates- NO! That incorporates motion s- oh god no! That incorporates motion sensor tech- NO 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 WE WERE SO CLOSE! WE WERE ALMOST FREE! Why must we forever carry our failures around with us like a scrotum full of horseshoes? Oh, you can pick up a virtual gun with your actual hand and fire it. Cause that's what I want added to the process of shooting an enemy, isn't it? My noodly wrist groping for something that isn't there like a castrated wanker. Hey, Captain Scott, how about we make sure we can actually get to the South Pole before we start making plans to erect the Statue of Liberty there? Bethesda's entire press conference was apparently being run by Captain Obvious. In it, we learned that Doom is gory, and that Fallout 4, which was already available for pre-order, to people with some kind of pathological hatred of their own money, is a Fallout game. But if there's been too much action, narrative and exploration in Fallout games for your tastes, and you'd rather have spent your time messing around with The Sims building editor, then Fallout 4's got you covered. For everyone else, Fallout 4 talks up the illusory holy grail of total freedom, but a game where the player can do anything is a game that focuses on nothing. Also, there was Dishonored 2, whoops, Butterfingers dropped my honour again, but perhaps it would be quicker to skip pre-rendered trailers as they tell us nothing except hey, this is a thing that may someday exist, and we will literally promise anything if it makes one person in the audience go woo. Of course, the line between pre-rendered and gameplay trailers grew rather thin during the Microsoft show, awkward segue, where Rise of the Tomb Raider, Halo 5 and a new Gears of War joined forces to become the Back to Formula gang. You think you've been dragged along a linear sequence of set pieces before, but you've never been dragged along a linear sequence of set pieces like this, except you have, in all the other games with the same name as us, but shut up and look at the skyboxes. The shocking Microsoft announcement was that backwards compatibility is coming to the Xbox One. Before we could even start undoing our trousers, however, However, the great big asterisk came like a shuriken to the eye socket. It's just for a limited range of 360 games. It's like pirates kidnapped our wife and now expect a round of applause because they brought her back after two years and only cut off most of her arms and legs. Let's skip ahead a bit to the recipient of Microsoft's wildest fantasy hate fucks, Sony, and nuzzle my hairy crevices if they didn't actually announce The Last Guardian again. The logical successor to its two predecessors in that it looks just like Ico, except with a colossus instead of the flaky bitch. Not out till next year though, they must be programming this game by carving ones and zeros into stone tablets. Otherwise, if Microsoft had the Back to Formula gang, Sony's theme was get in that nostalgic comfort zone and start digging, bitch. Rest assured Uncharted 4 looks exactly the same as all the other ones. Here's a remake of Final Fantasy 7 we'll tell you fuck all about, because you already busted a nut before we reached the fourth syllable of the title, didn't you? And last but not least, Shenmue 3's Kickstarter! That's fucking weak. That's about ten levels below a pre-rendered trailer. Maybe next year you could just have someone come on and go, I'm thrilled to announce that I'm now going to stand here and imagine a game in my head. Give us cash. Right, what else? We knew about Assassin's Creed Syndicate, of course, but even if we didn't, it hardly seems worth mentioning. It's like announcing that the tide will continue to go in and out. I don't see much to indicate that Syndicate is adding much to the formula, but we do know that its idea of a relatable protagonist is someone who beats people up until they join his street gang, leads them into a big fight, then fucks off. Maybe he's auditioning for the all hunky bloke's production of A Clockwork Orange. Later we poked our head around old man Nintendo's door for a bit, and I'm thinking the Nintendo 3DS should be renamed the Nintendo Psych. Hey, we're totally announcing a new Zelda, a new Mario, and a new Metroid Prime! Oh, they're all on the 3DS! Psych! I say Metroid Prime, there's no sign of Samus Aran, and it looks like an N64 threw up on a Star Wars prequel. This is like when your nan buys you Christmas presents. This is what you wanted, isn't it, dear? Almost, nan! I actually wanted you to jam it between your crusty folds and hammer it home with a wire brush! Star Fox was about as good as it got, and that looked like a Star Wars prequel threw up on an N64. Just a little bit of time left now for some quickfire snarks. Hitman. Square Enix must be confident in it because they're doing the reboot with the same name thing and they won't be able to play that card again for at least nine minutes. Mass Effect Andromeda, aka Mass Effect Escape from the Corner We Wrote Ourselves Into. Nice picture postcard landscapes, I look forward to next year's teaser when you think of something to put in them. Horizon Zero Dawn. 
Nope, I have no earthly clue what that title means. I suspect you came up with it by throwing a set of refrigerator poetry magnets at the side of a speeding car. Well, violate my sense of intestinal security if it isn't another Alone in the Dark game. This venerable series stretches all the way back to 1992 when it virtually codified the fixed camera survival horror genre. Someone even awarded it the ECTS 1993 Best Graphics Award and managed to keep a straight face. From those lofty heights, the series went downhill quickly, spawning two sequels and two attempted reboots that wobbled up and down between Big Poo Sandwich and Big Poo Sandwich with Ketchup. But still, I'm surprised that a new installment to this decades-long legacy managed to slip under my radar and I'd like to know where they were hiding it, because it should be put back there with ex Extreme Force. Yes, experience has taught me to watch out for a couple of obvious warning signs when it comes to games. The mysterious absence of hype, the attempt to sneak out onto the Steam listings on the week of a summer sale as if the publisher was forced to fulfil an obligation but was praying to God that no one would notice it, and the mysterious urge to club myself in the head with a frozen walrus cog as I attempt to play the fucking thing. More alarm bells start to ring when you boot up a game called Alone in the Dark and the first three options on the title menu are host game join server, followed grudgingly by single player thrown out like a chicken bone from the feasting table. I guess we're co-op multiplayer now. They fucked up the dark thing in the last Alone in the Dark by setting the whole game on fire, so now they're fucking up the alone part instead. Yeah, I guess I'm pretty lame. Well, I'll just toddle off to the bottom of Metacritic for the rest of time then. Not so fast, Alone in the Dark Illumination. You're getting a full review for no better reason than because you tried to sneak out quietly like a fart in a job interview, and I ain't letting that fly on my watch. Alone in the Dark is indeed a Left 4 Dead style four-player co-op shooter, so like a deep space exploration probe, it's about six or seven years behind the rest of planet Earth. Each player takes the role of one of four characters, the Hunter, Edward Carnby, whose main role in combat is to wear a t-shirt with series continuity written on it, the witch, whose role is to look good in a miniskirt and fling lightning with a gesture like she's trying to shake snot off her hand, and then there's a priest and a female engineer. And isn't it nice to know cast members of Firefly are still finding work? These four unique talents work extremely well together, or extremely poorly, I don't know, because I found no functional public servers and I didn't want to lose what few Steam friends I have by asking them to download this garbage. I played alone in the single player and learned to live with the sense of rejection from three quarters of the random pickups being for someone else. Else. Why even spawn the fucking things? It's like online dating all over again. But I don't remember any moment in the game when having another player around would have helped, frankly. The central game mechanic around which the game names itself is the fact that monsters only become vulnerable in light. This is explained by a piece of story dialogue saying, the monster became vulnerable in light. Nice world building there, alone in the dark. As the light hit the creature, mutated plants in the graveyard soil, still clinging to its rotten form, grew with supernatural speed, pushing the hardened scales of its outer flesh apart. See how easy this is? I just made that up! Monsters only being vulnerable in light is the kind of mechanic that probably sounded like a good idea at the planning stage, but in practice it means turning on a light and then waiting for the enemy to queue up in single file for an ass whooping. But the enemies constantly respawn and you're not going to be completing the current arbitrary fetch quest standing under a streetlight like a mournful hooker in a gritty musical, so you keep moving and swiftly find that it's a lot more expedient to just maintain enough of a brisk walking pace to stay ahead of the shambling horrors and go about your daily life unmolested. That's if it weren't for the fucking poison spitting ones that make no sound and have laser accuracy so the first time you know of its presence is the moment when you get a shamrock shake to the eyeballs. The scenery's in cahoots, because it maliciously becomes non-corporeal just when you think it will block the shot. And then the poison will make your health tick down for a bit. It might as well just knock it off in one go. There are no healing abilities or items you can carry, so if you're low on health and not three feet from a resupply shelf, all you can do is try to adopt a hilarious suggestive pose before you die. You'd think a game with a priest class but no self-heal ability would be like a Cub Scout camping weekend without a bedwetting incident, but in truth the classes all have the exact same role. Shoot the baddies when they're in light, use special abilities to kill baddies that aren't in light, in which case you might as well just stick with the hunter who gets as many guns as he can fit in his wife fronts and a fucking flamethrower. I know a very few instances in which the word flamethrower could not be preceded by the word fucking. Hey, I can infuse my bullets with the power of Christ in order to turn a single monster into a light source so that all the monsters around it, or I could just napalm the room with my flamethrower, or I suppose you could just napalm the room with your fucking flamethrower. Must have been a blow to spend your whole life currying favour with Jesus to the point that he'll let you weaponize him and only then find out that gasoline exists. You know, I could go on picking apart how all the little cracks and subtle odours go together to make this monster turd, but let's get down to broad analysis. Not that kind of broad analysis. Is it fun? No. It's as fun as playing 200 consecutive games of patty cake during a prolonged blackout. Is it scary? No. It's as scary as sea above. Fuck it then. I stopped playing after four missions and I can tell the developers gave up on it long before I did, with its text dumps in place of narrative and the way it was released like an unwanted dog on the side of a highway. So why should I put in any more effort? I'm going to review the remainder of the missions from their names alone. Dark Crypt as opposed to all those lovely well-illuminated crypts where all the dance parties take place. Seriously guys, you couldn't think of a single other word that means foreboding? What about creepy crypt? Or does that sound too much like a Banjo-Kazooie level? Reflective pond. Could have done with one of these before you embarked on this venture, couldn't you Atari? Assuming the sight of your own visage doesn't turn you to stone. Sonorous sewer? 
What's that? The new album by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds? Silent Quarry. Oh, I see what you did there. Train Graveyard. Well, that's what happens when you try to get home from Tawong Station at one in the morning. Final Facility! And how very welcome it is. But I really think the series has only been going downhill since Final Facility 7. In case you've been spending the last century sitting at the bottom of the Challenger Deep with a really, really interesting book, Batman is a popular superhero with the power of infinite money, with which he bought a suit of armour for punching people who don't have suits of armour. He's also an incredibly boring asshole with no hobbies, who compensates for this fact by ensuring that no one other than himself gets to do anything interesting. No really fully equipped police force, it's too dangerous for you out there, just leave it to me, my ridiculous car, and my death wish. If Batman's pointy ears represented his martyr complex, they would get caught in power lines. In Batman Arkham Knight, our hero must face his deadliest foe yet, a 30 FPS frame rate cap. The PC Master Race started sharpening their carbon fibre knives after a PC port that has been most charitably described as a face full of piss on a hot summer's day limped through the castle gates. I wouldn't know about that, I played the console version, because I recalled the Arkham Origins PC port being dodgy as well, and I too possess a superpower, the power to remember things. Such as the fact that my new game Hatfall is out and you can play it now, hip hip hooray, it's great! Arkham Knight is the final instalment of the Batman Arkham Trilogy, and it does refer to itself as a trilogy, so I guess Arkham Origins is a officially the red-headed stepchild. A welcome final instalment indeed. Not that it's been a bad series, it's just done all it can do now, and the story of Arkham Knight is as worn out and held together with pins as the bones of most of Gotham City's thugs at this point. The problem with superhero movies is that they only have three plots, villain endangers hero's loved one, hero faces villain who is dark reflection of themselves, villain threatens to cover a city in gas that will make everyone as petty as they are. Arkham Knight goes through all three multiple times, with varying degrees of disconnect and all messily layering over each other like an orgy in a poorly made lasagna. Scarecrow is doing the gas spreading thing, but he weirdly obligingly gives everyone a few weeks notice, so all the normal people evacuate Gotham before the game starts, leaving him to prepare a gas attack upon a mostly deserted city, whose remaining population consists largely of his own men. Christ knows how the henchman temp agency meets demand in Gotham City, but Batman is pledged to defend Gotham and he's not gonna stop just cause there's no one in it except enemy thugs, for even they deserve a second chance as well as a shattered vertebrae or two. Batman's pledge to defend the helpless innocents who have all already fucked off is an unavoidable plot hole since a sequel demands a bigger sandbox, and a bigger sandbox demands better transportation, hence Batmobile. And we couldn't have had a Batmobile while the streets were littered with clueless window shoppers hoping to get through the day without having their pelvic bones shattered by an ill-judged power slide. The Batmobile is the new gameplay mechanic demanded by innovation, now all we need is for the word Zock to appear when we punch someone and we'll finally have the truly complete Batman experience. The problem is that the old hookshot hang glider combo was and still is perfectly adequate for getting around, and is handy for surveying the city for maliciously unbroken spines, so the game ends up having to force us to use the Batmobile and that's largely the titular Arkham Knight's job. The Arkham Knight, besides being a classic case of coming up with the name before the concept, is a militia leader who fills the streets with unmanned tanks for you to blow up. He's secretly a figure from Batman's past who knows all his tricks but can't be that smart, cause if he was, he'd sellotape a single live person to one of the 70 million drones Batman blows up without a second thought, after which he'd have to run off and cry on a gargoyle for the rest of his fucking life. Even before release I thought it was weird that a series about being sneaky and clever and unexpectedly jumping on people should introduce demolition derbies as a central mechanic, and having to smash up a load of Tonka toys every now and again feels more like an interlude than a natural addition to the sneaky punchy gameplay, which remains perfectly fine, bordering on slightly overloaded with gadgets that I largely forget about as long as the hookshot still works. The only major thing added to that aspect is the ability to instantly take down up to five lads at once, which is an innovative addition to gameplay if holding down the fast forward button is an innovative way to watch films. Certainly not as innovative as Hatfall, the new zero punctuation game for browser and tablets by me, Pluggo Pluggo, etc. So, Scarecrow and Arkham Knight have joined forces to destroy Batman, and it seems that the method they have chosen to do so is to bore him to death. What the fuck happened to the Scarecrow who was the highlight of the first game, that cackling, energetic, genuinely scary motherfucker, who'd secretly slip you fear gas so you only knew he was around cause all the chandeliers started looking like your father's willy. He was a guy who acted. The Scarecrow in this game is a guy who just talks in a droning monotone, so whenever it's his turn to have a go on the citywide PA system, I think for a moment it accidentally got tuned to the shipping forecast, they turned him into Jerry Generic, the standard supervillain, and he looks exactly like Skeletor from the Masters of the Universe film. Meanwhile, the Arkham Knight does his bit by flooding the game with interminable, tedious side missions, taking down militia strongholds, which usually entails beating up yet another group of identical toss buckets. The other side mission paths with colourful villains are more fun, but mostly have about three to six missions in total, whereas there are fucking 40-odd militia strongholds of varying 
ending types. I wouldn't mind, but you need to do a minimum of all this bollocks to get the final ending. It's like withholding the last few pages of a book until the reader has eaten all of the previous ones. There is, however, a surprise third main villain, who I won't spoil, but at least puts the colour back in the game's cheeks. So Arkham Knight does have its moments, certainly better than Origins, and is at worst still fun enough. It should definitely be the last one, because it's about 40% using up the last of the series' good ideas, and 60% pissing about. And on a final note, what is it with this game and female characters? Now, I know that the number of games that don't piss off some gender activist or another can be counted on the fingers of a retired bomb disposal expert, but even I felt something was off. Catwoman spends the whole game locked in a basement wearing a slave collar waiting for Batman to come take her for walkies, and without wishing to spoil, all the major ladies have a particularly nasty time of it. Then again, it's nasty all over, the men aren't exactly having a jolly locker room towel flicking contest. You know what, forget I said anything. I ain't teabagging this beehive any further. I'm gonna go play Hatfall instead, check it out! The continued popularity of Yoshi ever since his, her, or its first appearance in Super Mario World provides a lesson for us all. Your future is guaranteed if you're willing to let someone important ride you. That particular investment is now paying off with Yoshi's Woolly World, another game to add to Nintendo's growing and still slightly baffling stable of old properties remade in arts and crafts materials. One wonders as to the point, perhaps Nintendo finds some catharsis in retreading its history in a manner that can be easily set on fire. In this case, I suspect that it's partly because making Yoshi out of inorganic matter cunningly skirts around a couple of lingering awkward questions surrounding the character, such as are we literally consuming our enemies and then either converting them into our unborn children or pooing them out as hardened egg-shaped shits, both of which are equally fucked up in their own way, whereas now it can just say it's alright, everything's made of knitted wool. You're just unravelling enemies and turning them into yarn balls through your butthole! As the game opens, all the happy little Yoshis, most of whom seem to have really gotten into the body modding scene, are living an idyllic life of hopping up and down and making noises like guinea pigs being trodden on, when the minions of Bowser show up and kidnap most of them, presumably to shut them up for five minutes. What few Yoshis remain, is Yoshi the name of the species or of just the green one specifically? What few cartoon velociraptors remain must then set off to journey across six worlds of eight levels to recover all their lost friends, by gathering the five body parts hidden in each level and stitching them back together. Not weird, it's wool, remember? So begins the usual odyssey of Forest Desert Ocean Jungle Ice World Fire World Boss, cunt. Or more accurately, Forest Desert Candyland Jungle Ice World Boss. Fucking candy worlds always messing up the Mario rhythm, as well as my diabetes. I say Mario, but despite the fact that we're battling Mario's villains and playing as Mario's favourite arse cushion, Mario himself is in absentia. That's noteworthy because the first thing you need to know about Yoshi's Worry Wart is that it's probably safe to skip if you've replayed Yoshi's Island at all recently. It'd be little more than a remake if it weren't for the absence of Baby Mario, which was always a curious case study. We have Mario, one of the most beloved characters in popular culture today, and we have babies, which human beings are hardwired to want to protect, and yet somehow the combination of the two elements ended up creating something that inspired most people to fantasise about stamping on the little shit's face, until its jaw came off and its perpetual mewling was drowned out by a throat full of blood and bone fragments. So now you don't get your baby knocked off every time you get hit, nor are you counterintuitively forced to chase after it rather than gratefully fist bump the enemy responsible. But all that relieved irritation has to settle somewhere, and it may have not been in Yoshi's best interest to ditch the little scroat, because I'm suddenly hyper aware of all the repeated vocalisations he makes. Going, mm -yeah, every time he's aiming to throw an egg is cute, charitably speaking, maybe twice, and then it starts rubbing against the nerves, sounds like a chipmunk trying to lift a heavy power sander. And while we're on the subject, I know the air gaming controls had to be kinda shitty on the snares, because they didn't have fancy things like analogue sticks in that infamous dark age of modern history, but not to put too fine a point on it, we do now. Maybe get some use out of your fancy controller rather than map every control to at least four buttons on the off chance that the game's being played at the circus and Billy the Lobster Boy wants to have a go. Anyway, as well as the five Yoshi body parts, each level has five flowers and twenty special gems, and if you miss any of them then the end of the level will make damn sure that you know it. No, of course you don't have to laboriously check every inch of the map for secrets, you can still move on to the next level. Also, you don't have to get A's at school, do you? D's still a passing grade, there's no difference. And who cares if your mother weeps with shame every every day. At least she hasn't killed herself like your dad did, you fucking loser. The point is, there's something rather unreasonable about Yoshi's Whirly Wonk's completionist gameplay, especially considering that half the secret pickups are flat out invisible until you touch them. It's like we cleaned the barracks from top to bottom but we didn't polish the brass unicorn the drill sergeant hid under the floorboards, so we're doing 50 press ups anyway. After a while, most of the now mandatory Miiverse posts that the game flashed up while loading the next level were along the lines of HELP I CAN'T FIND PICKUP 17 OF 94 and HELP MY BOTTOM NEEDS WIPING AND MOTHER ISN'T HOME FROM 
from work yet. In fact, while the levels in World 1 had no end of the usual best game evers hanging off them, by the time I was in World 6, the Miiverse posts were getting a bit thin on the ground. Some levels could only populate the loading screens with six copies of the same post, or meaningless scribbles someone probably uploaded by mistake while they were trying to chase a naughty kitten off their touchscreen. All of which gave me a whatever happened to baby Jane, look they still love me kind of vibe. Do you think Miiverse posts will still be going up on these games in 20 years, saying things like, wow looking at these old games really puts Nintendo's recent massacre into perspective? Yoshi's Weary Wank also adds a badge system where you can choose to spend some of your hard stolen gems to equip a special buff for the upcoming level, so if for example I noticed the level was called something like Hot Times in Fiery Jeff's Lava Bungalow, I'd cunningly equip the Immunity to Fire badge and turn the level into an absolute joke, which has the warp whistle quality in that it feels like a cheat the game gives you, and seems an odd addition to a game designed for psychotic completionists. Anyway, it's a pretty vestigial feature since I didn't use it under any other circumstances, not everyone having the courtesy of Fiery Jeff to signpost the hazards. Nintendo remake their old tat a lot, and as long as they turn a profit then anything I say is but the tiny guffs of a blue bottle in the face of Christ the Redeemer, but I wonder if they're adopting the right attitude. They should take the opportunity to re-examine their old games and ask questions like, do we really need to feel shackled to an aiming reticle that has to wave back and forth like we're disinterestedly sponging down a beached whale, rather than questions like, do you think we could paint Yoshi's knackers purple this time? Oh, scrotum inflammations, is it July already? That time of year when the bite of the Australian winter whistles through the empty Steam listings, and gamers roam the streets chanting laments flagellating themselves with the loose USB cords of unplugged controllers and peripherals, their cargo shorts growing threadbare and crusty in the cold. Yes, it's the usual mid-year post E3 release drought when everything takes on the atmosphere of mourning on the last day of a mid to low tier anime convention, so as usual I go to Steam and ask what's popular enough that I can lose a few more viewers by whittling all over it. Well, there's Ark Survival Evolved, I played that for a couple of hours and axed a stegosaurus to death, whereupon its ragdoll turned somersaults in glee at not having to be in this fucking game anymore. Well, you know what's top seller right now? Rocket League. Go on. It's soccer meets driving. Okay, stop going on. No other three words kill my interest faster, except perhaps Ark Survival Evolved. Come on, Steve, meet me halfway. I've never been shy with my credit card details, so drop the coy act. And then suddenly the front page asked me, hey, have you replayed Cave Story lately? Which I interpreted as a sign from the heavens, so after clearing up a drink spillage, I downloaded Cave Story again to do a retro review, bringing back memories of the first time I downloaded it in 2004. That's a memento mori for you, isn't it? 2004 being retro now. Surely nothing downloadable is retro. Retro to me is anything that was ever sold on a physical medium with which you could conceivably bludgeon someone to death. Cave Story is a platformer shooter type thing developed by someone or something called Pixel. It was originally freeware, it is now sold on Steam for $14.99. So whatever Pixel was, it was apparently playing the fucking long game. But I have a special place in my heart for the solo development racket, Play Hatful. Sorry, I'm not sure that was subliminal enough. Play Hatful, you pricks! What the solo developed game loses in graphical quality and broader marketability, it makes up for with good old fashioned heart. And heart and art so often go together, especially when talking in a Cockney accent. I remember Cave Story being really good, but that was before eight years of nitpicking gave me this discerning, bloodshot, masturbation dimmed eye, and in replaying, a lot of shit I'd forgotten about started rubbing me up the wrong way anew. The jumping is floaty as arse, a big chubby arse that farts helium. You climb to the top of your arc like a majestic salmon swimming upstream, and then you'd fucking drop like you've been swiped out of the air by a hungry grizzly. And the progression has that bad habit of Japanese games in that it's very flaggy. I said flaggy, as in it has a lot of flags. So you'll explore the whole starting area until you find the one map square that makes the story go forward by one step if you stand in it and press the use button, then explore the whole area again looking for the next one, which is obnoxious enough in the starting village where you have to nearly drown yourself picking something off the bottom of a pond before anyone will give you the time of day, and even worse when there are enemies around and you fight your way to the far end of the map only to find a locked door whose key is in the possession of the guy who sent you on this quest in the first place, but because you didn't specifically ask him for it, rimbly grimbly bim. But rimbly grimbly bim aside, the flaggy path is used to maintain control of the linear story. If the story's bad, it can be like going through life with a partially formed twin attached to your leg, with a tendency to bellow swear words at formal occasions, but happily Cave Story has a good story that I don't mind being join the dots through. It's the classic tale of an expedition gone wrong, a mad scientist, a monster shaped like a briefcase, and a race of cute cuddly rabbit people being violently beaten against the walls, floor and ceiling, making adorable squeaky noises with every impact. It's a story about characters, and while it's rather thick on the ground for the first half, it knows when to take a back seat as the gameplay ramps up. It's the kind of thing that could only exist in a solo developed game, because if Pixel had had a friend around, let's call him graphical user interface, he might have said something like, do you not think all the gritty violent drama being experienced by these Hello Kitty fuzzy rabbit people with heads like beanbag chairs lends a certain incongruity of tone? That's a mighty pretty mouth you've got, graphical user interface. What I also like about the story is that we're seeing it through the eyes of a guy who showed up halfway through it, whose presence no one particularly minds for some reason, and who awkwardly hangs around while all the characters with actual personality discuss events. It's like if the protagonist of Return of the Jedi was the little fish-faced lad who hung out in the cockpit next to Lando Calrissian. It means that little time is wasted on introductions 
or backstory and we can cut straight to the fun parts, but the story is still there, just not in a forced, hey, you're totally invested in this struggle and in love with the one hot girl character because we fucking say you are kind of way. I've often heard Cave's story referred to as Metroidvania, but I'm not sure I agree that it is, because it's not a terribly explorey game. A Metroidvania without central exploration elements is like a high school gob job without the vague sense of anticlimax. Part of that's the unique weapon system where rather than exploring to find weapon upgrades, you pick up bits of dead enemies and jam them in your gun until someone hits you and they all plop out again. There are health upgrades, but they're all about as hard to find as your mum on a nudist beach, and while there are a couple of secret paths you can take to unlock alternative weapons and endings, exploring will not help you find them, because the first thing you have to do for the super secret ending is not collect a jetpack, and I sincerely doubt anyone figured that out by themselves. I mean, for me, that goes against the instinct so hard that my bones try to tear themselves out of my hands in protest. So that's one problem with making a game by yourself. It might make perfect sense to you, but it's entirely possible that you're mad. Maybe run it by someone or look in the mirror to see if there's an axe in your skull, but besides that, Cave Story is an exemplar of solo development. It compensates for its failings by focusing on its strengths, the plot, the characters, and good old-fashioned raw gameplay design, with challenge that curves naturally from pimpsicles to herding honey badgers hard, unless you get the secret ending, in which case it's herding honey badgers on the side of a tall building and ensuring that every single one of them passes GCSE English Lit. This game's shit. Oh sorry, I usually do more of a setup than that, don't I? I'll start again. Goodness me, this game's shit! If you're not familiar with it, the long-running Godzilla franchise is what happens when you nuke a country twice. You see, when you punish a child by making them smoke an entire carton of cigarettes, you shouldn't be surprised if they end up addicted. And similarly, when you go into someone's country and blow up all their shit to make them stop being jerks, you've only yourself to blame if watching all their shit getting blown up becomes the only way they can get hard. Godzilla has been an icon of Japanese pop culture since 1954. This very year, in fact, the Shinjuku Ward of Tokyo named Godzilla an official cultural ambassador. I'm guessing this is like when the Queen of England knights popular celebrities, it's just something they do every now and again to make it look like they have an actual purpose. And now the venerable institution of Godzilla is represented in the current generation of video games with this. It would have been shrewder to put out Godzilla-branded Zyklon B canisters. You'd think this would be a no-brainer. AAA video games long seem to have resigned themselves to a life of licking the back window of the mediocrity bus, but if there's one thing it still does better than anything else, it's blowing shit up. Games like Just Cause and Prototype and even Angry Birds prove that smashing things like its pussy after a lengthy prison sentence is a winning formula. You'd think that Godzilla as a concept would wear that niche like a vacuum-sealed rubber johnny. The problem is Godzilla Godzilla the game is trying to look like the old Japanese Godzilla movies rather than any modern interpretation. Oh yes, there's no opportunity to crush Matthew Broderick underfoot, more's the pity. And to its credit, the game looks exactly like how those old kaiju movies did, like a bunch of dudes in fake rubber costumes tripping over cardboard boxes with doors and windows painted on, each with so many spark packs strapped to their bodies that the only difference between them and a suicide bomber is a sense of purpose in life. They even managed to recreate the way this costume's jaw flaps loosely on its hinge as a raw sound effect plays that doesn't sync up with the movement. So, in the category of looking as terrible as its source material, Godzilla earns its solitary A+. I played the PS4 version, and graphically it looks like it belongs on the PS2. Even that is being totally unfair on the PS2. Shadow of the Colossus was on the PS2, but it managed to make its big things feel big. It was like laying my head on the floor of a supermarket as your mum power slides around the corner on a mobility scooter. Godzilla, meanwhile, thinks that all you have to do is make everything move like it's made of depleted uranium. Godzilla himself walks like his parents are having sex and he's trying to sneak past their bedroom door, and every time you press an attack button you're committed to it for the next half hour. So obviously the level designers thought, hey, since it takes you the length of an average royal variety performance to walk anywhere. Not much point in making the levels any bigger than a one-bedroom apartment. We never see things from any level of scale other than Godzilla-sized. Without comparison or any visible pedestrians, we could just be watching slow-motion footage of a Boston Terrier in a Halloween costume ruining a Lego project. Your goal in each level is to blow up all the ridiculously huge spinning generators that probably require more energy to keep spinning than they could ever possibly generate. While you're doing that, you also have to stand Godzilla in some places where some cheeky candid photos can be taken of him for the swimsuit edition of Wrath of Nature Illustrated. You do this roughly ten squillion times, and then the game goes, oh actually, I'm not totally convinced you're ready for the last two levels, just to be safe you'd better do it another ten squillion times. The reason given is that you need to gather sufficient intelligence on Godzilla by going through several different mission paths. How much intelligence do you need? He's got like three attacks, and anything he steps on is not going to be allowed on any roller coasters anytime soon, that's all you need. And when I say different mission paths, I mean exactly the same missions, but with a slight variance in how quickly the threat level rises. You say, if you're not careful, the Japanese authorities might raise the effectiveness of the defence forces from zero to Two zero times two. The only thing that can damage Godzilla in a way he can't immediately regenerate is other kaijus. They're all classic enemies of Godzilla, I think, because every time anyone says their name out loud you can practically hear them mutter registered trademark. They're not trying to defend humanity, nor are you defending humanity from them. They just sort of show up, like a nosy neighbour peering over the fence. Then the two of you clash, by which I mean you go at each other like a pair of nursing home residents
students who both walked into the TV room and simultaneously noticed there was only one free armchair. The kaiju fights are about the only point at which the game threatens to seriously think about becoming interesting, until you realise you can just mash heavy attack, which interrupts basically everything, occasionally using the uninterruptible super attack when the enemy manages to get one of their long bullshit combos out that you can't dodge or get out of the way of because you're a dude wearing a rubber costume that weighs about 50 pounds, and you can't even turn around without filing notice at least 30 days in advance. I wish I could get through one day of my life without asking this question, but what the fuck am I doing here? Am I supposed to be rooting for Godzilla? I guess so, because at the end, after we've totally wrecked up the place, the Prime Minister's all like, this was a lesson from nature, and Godzilla will return if humanity ever goes too far again. Oh, heaven forfend that humanity go too far, and start doing something irresponsible like stomp all over someone else's shit. Godzilla's not our abusive spouse, Prime Minister lady, stop rationalising. Maybe he's just being a dick. A game in which we get to play a big evil giant monster rubbing its fat ass all over a city like a huge stupid dog trying to get comfortable on an expensive wedding cake could in theory offer catharsis, but that's not what this game feels like. It feels like we're a guy in a costume who just wants to act like a dick, taking out his impotent rage on some cereal boxes. Being a big destructive monster would be fun. Just being a dick is not. If I wanted to be a dick, I'd shave my head bald and sit in a hammock all day spitting on a lingerie catalogue. Okay, maybe it wasn't fair of me to dismiss Rocket League out of hand two weeks ago, it's just that hearing the word soccer always fires my instinct to retract my testicles and cement my butthole shut. I have bad memories from my school days, of shivering on a frozen playing field in the mandatory tiny shorts, waiting for a ball to bounce past and shortly afterwards my head to be bounced between several pairs of studded boots. That's the last time I take a teaching job. Fuck you, that was an actual joke. I couldn't escape the fact, however, that Rocket League is pretty crazy popular, and while the same could be said for HIV in sub-Saharan Africa, it's worth a look at least. So I gave it a download to see for myself, and half an hour later I'd seen enough. Not that it was an awful experience, that was just all there was of it to see. Maybe that's the key to massive popularity these days, you make it small and snacky and pass it around like a bowl of Pringles, since the average attention span of young people nowadays is however long it takes to swipe their thumb across a smartphone. Rocket League is a soccer game between two small teams of remote control cars. You have the ability to drive around, up walls, and leap and frolic about at each other like a hybrid of a spring lamb and a rutting stag and somewhere in the ungainly pile of gambling plastic vehicles is a ball that you're trying to get into the other team's goal. And that's it, really. The pitches are all the same size and shape. There are no upgrades besides cosmetics, so players with more time served aren't advantaged with better cars or hood-mounted Bobby Charltons. The games load and connect fast, the matches are short, it's just in, out and satisfied, which is funnily enough my nickname among the single ladies. I've been rather cunningly undercut here, my ability to complain is limited by the sheer lack of features to complain about. Well, fuck you, Rocket League, I'm gonna try anyway. There are two camera modes, normal and focused on the ball, and they both suck. You have to pick between knowing which way you're going and knowing where the ball is, and while I'm doing my silly car footballing, I don't want to have to wrestle with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Also, if a player is a big sucky sore loser and drops out, they get replaced by bots, which always immediately dominate the game because they're trying horror of horrors to win, not just leap about next to the ball like dolphins alongside a fishing boat. Fucking spoil sports. But I have to admit I had fun playing Rocket League, partly because I'm surprisingly good at it. See, the ambition of most players on public servers seems to be to blindly hurl themselves towards the ball at all times in the hope of being able to brag to their mum that they almost touched it once, whereas I just hung around the centre pitch doing donuts so I could wait for the ball to pop out of the six-lane pile-up like a bar of soap from a shower room orgy and cheekily tap it into the goal. Must be frustrating for people making really complex games to see Rocket League do so well from just plonking some plays in an empty room and waving a flag, but if it's any consolation it's not the kind of experience that stays with you. The Pringles analogy fits it well, it's quite lovely while it's in your mouth, but after you swallow it there's a momentary pang of shame and then no one has to worry about it ever again, except your long-suffering digestive system. Right, well that was over quick, which is my other nickname among the single ladies, might as well do another small game while we're here. How about Tembo the Badass Elephant, an action platformer for digi-download? There's a lot about Tembo that just screams indie gaming. The core concept has that very indie try-hard random humour about it, like a man wearing a lampshade in desperate hope of being accepted by his peers. Ooh, it's a commando who's also an elephant. Wow, that's not the sort of thing you'd expect a commando to be. Consider my mind blown like a newly divorced banker on a business trip to Thailand. Also, when it was first released on Steam, they accidentally put out the wrong build at first and had to fix it the next day. Kuh, what a bunch of sillies. But that's the kind of endearing baby giraffe stumbling you have to expect from an indie game. Wait a minute, published by Sega? Developed by Game Freak? What, the Pokemon guys? You know, that actually makes a strange kind of sense. I know I'd want to do something a little bit different if I'd spent the last 20 years struggling to come up with hundreds of new ways to draw a cat wrong. Anyway, Tembo is caught somewhere between Contra and Yoshi's Island. It's a linear, as in literal straight line path of levels, running across a city shaped like a peanut for no particular reason except to establish a visual theme of things elephants like being good. Your task in each level, as well as to get to the end, is to find ten hostages hidden in secret places, that's Yoshi's Island's influence, and to murder a set checklist of enemy soldiers and vehicles, that's Contra's… uh, Contra's
contribution. It does the Yoshi's Island thing where it makes you very much aware of the percentage of collectibles you've found and or murdered, and extremely paranoid about taking what seems to be the obvious way forward, while there remain nondescript walls you haven't yet banged your head against looking for secrets. Tembo has three ways of moving through life. Standard walking is so slow it's like he's propelling himself forward through the force of his elephantine turds alone. Then there's a charge attack that's on just the annoying side of too fast when you're precision platforming. Lastly, if you press charge while jumping, then Tembo will hurl himself forward like he's trying to stop a bullet meant for the elephant president. Precedent, if you will. One might reasonably infer that Tembo the Badass Elephant is styling itself a comedy game, but in execution it only has one joke that the title already gave away, and I can't sustain myself through the whole slog on a single custard pie. The little annoyances mount up, not having an in-between your movement speed is one, and the live system is another. Those haven't gotten any less annoying since the last time one of them jizzed in my kettle, but one might argue that the most important thing I can tell you about a game is the moment at which I cried, BORED NOW, and threw the controller into next door's oubliette. In this case, it was during the final boss, which could well be the unlikeliest possible moment to experience BORED NOW, when you're over the crest and speeding rapidly downhill towards victory and glory and only a sudden ramping of challenge stands in your way, but all that sudden ramping did in this case was make me realise that even after Tenbo's entire epic 12 level odyssey, I still gave less of a shit than a cork suppository. Well, like a pair of stealth trousers, this was an unexpected turn up. A retro PC adventure game franchise dredged up from the most stagnant and constipated bowels of memory to be turned into an episodic adventure game series in which your choices have lingering effects on the plot, and it isn't by Telltale Games. If I were them, I'd start worrying about the sanctity of the cosy little niche they've made for themselves up the bumhole of other people's intellectual property. I remember hearing that Telltale Games might have been trying to get some fingers into the King's Quest pie at some point. Telltale Games are like a homeless person in a food court, sidling up to people with half-finished meals, going, Are you gonna eat that? Maybe that's why Sierra felt the time was right too, as my old elocution teacher used to say, Shit or get off the pot. King's Quest is remembered as one of the big classic franchises from the earliest days of PC adventure gaming. Christ knows why, it was fucking awful. Set in a generic fairy tale world, designed by someone one suspects has never had an orgasm in their entire life, the games were somehow simultaneously vomit from every orifice twee and utterly jigsaw killer psychotic as they violently murdered the protagonists for walking over a blade of grass too quick. They had the air of taking one psycho ex-girlfriend to Disneyland. I can only imagine how much more disturbing it would have been if any of the protagonists had had more personality than a dented shovel with a smiley face drawn on it. And on that note, the new modern Sierra seems to wholly agree, because with the exception of a few place and character names and the occasional bullshit death for old time's sake that can be immediately reversed, like you kept your finger on the previous page in a choose your own adventure book, old King's Quest is the only thing that hasn't influenced new King's Quest much. It seems to have drawn the same conclusion everyone with eyeballs and at least one third of a brain did back in the late 80s, that LucasArts did this shit so much better than them. So the first episode plays like The Secret of Mon King's Isle Quest, in which naive young bumbler Sir Greybrush Threepum must overcome three trials in order to become a pirate, I mean knight. It also borrows from The Princess Bride, in the same way that Arab terrorists borrowed the Iranian embassy that one time. As well as using the same Grand Partel story to kid framing device, it borrows several characters and entire scenes right down to the fucking actors involved, which probably indicates the developers intended a sort of knowing homage, or at least that's what they told themselves as they clutched their pillows at night. That's a ways in. As the game opens, it's more ripping off I mean paying homage to Dragon's Lair, in an action-packed prologue section taking place in a Dragon's Lair. You might reasonably get the impression from this section that this adventure game is doing the modern adventure game thing of not being much of an adventure game at all, relying on linear set pieces, quick time events and the occasional inventory puzzle that requires an item that is lying in plain sight in the very next room. Some of you may even say to yourself, well at least we're not endlessly wandering through the same rooms with a bag full of garbage looking for the right thing to throw the garbage at, like in most adventure games, then the game will cough awkwardly and sidle towards the door, because don't you worry, you'll be joining the garbage collection agency soon enough when the game turns into the secret princess of Monkey Brideland. The prologue section is there to set up a recurring three-way branching path thing, in which you can choose to solve problems through strength, through intelligence or through compassion. So for sake of example, if you're in a food court and Telltale Games starts bothering your girlfriend for her leftovers, you could either deck him one, cleverly distract him with a picture of some sexy intellectual property you scribbled onto a napkin, or just let him have the leftovers and maybe a free motorboat to send him on his way. The point of all this is that it affects what lessons are learned by the mouthy little piranha the elderly Graham spends the game attempting to bore to death, which is as good a way to pay off pseudo-moral choice gameplay as any, I suppose, and gives us a fleeting glimpse of what it would be really like to play a child ruining simulator. In practice though, whichever path you want to take, all of them find common ground in the area of carting random garbage around similar rooms. Gameplay-wise, there's not a whole lot of difference between the intelligence and the compassion solutions. You wander around a needlessly confusing world map, trying to remember if this needlessly long forest path you're on is the one that leads to the right specific area of forest, and whether I took intelligence or compassion depended largely on which garbage puzzle I figured out the solution to first. Meanwhile, the strength path locks garbage puzzles in the boot so it can ride up in the front seat with the linear action set pieces again. Not that this is a choice of gameplay, because you have to do everything on the other two paths as well before the end, and I'd say the main problem with King's Quest is that its pick and mix bag was assembled with too broad a scooper. I came into this with just a vague nostalgia for early adventure games King's Quest, and by the end of one episode I've had to also like Uncharted-style action sequences, a first-person shooter section out of nowhere which evokes a game designer going <laughs> 
with their lips, and a competitive strategy game. I only like those when they're established with proper context, in another room, far away from me, that's on fire. All in all, King's Quest 2015 is one of those games that wants to have any identity other than its own. And while that's fair enough, considering that its identity until now was shovel face macabre death, its attempt to occupy a point somewhere in the middle of comedy, fairy tales, action and drama just leaves it like a laundrette run by genies, wishy-washy. It should also have remembered that if you want to do the naive, bumbling protagonist who must strive through his failings to overcome adversity thing, it would help if the protagonist had any adversity to face. The main reason why Graham wins the competition to become a knight is because the judges have all arbitrarily decided they want him to win, and if I were one of his opponents, being told I have to beat him again because the first two times weren't for realsies, I feel like I'd be fully justified in taking this matter to an impartiality committee, which is the name I have for my big sword. King's Quest has definitely improved upon the original, but maybe for the next episode it could strive to achieve something more ambitious than that, like walking across a room without snapping both legs off at the knee. I didn't want to do another indie double bill so soon after the last one, it feels like taking two dates to the cinema and making a play for the hypothetical stereo surreptitious tit grab, but I couldn't resist the almost serendipitous conflux of Nom Nom Galaxy coming off Early Access and Freedom Planet coming out on Wii U. And while the phrase coming out on Wii U is about as significant to me as the phrase hopes to have children of their own someday, it's as good an excuse as any to take a look at it. While the two games aren't thematically similar, they do both have titles consisting of an astronomical term and a word that ends with om, and on top of that, both of them provoke precisely the same reaction from me, the words how cute muttered through clenched teeth. So let's start off with Nom Nom Galaxy, aka the one I want to get out of the way first. Nom Nom Galaxy is a sort of resource gathering base building game in which the universe is dominated by all powerful soup companies, and you must travel to various alien worlds to establish new factories and discover new soup recipes. Gosh, isn't it quirky? It's Captain James T. Quirk of the Federation Starship Queen Surprise. Nom Nom Galaxy, I am going to fucking stab myself in the throat if I have to say that fucking title anymore, takes the Terraria Starbound route of the 2D Minecraft sort of jobby, but with two major differences. Firstly, blocks fall if not supported, so it's possible to bury yourself alive in dirt and cry, hey everyone, come and look at my Rupert Murdoch impression. And secondly, it's much more goal oriented. You move on to the next sandbox as soon as you've cornered the local soup market. And I appreciate that, because the trend with all these indie survival stroke base building games that swim in the wake of Minecraft's success trying to catch its divine farts in their mouths is to just set up a world and some rules and then hope that the player will build nine story castles that do bugger all, except to give them something to bore all their friends to death with every time they come over. Minecraft is the model train set of the modern age, with none of the catharsis that can come of going at it with a sledgehammer. So it's nice for a game to be something that you win. Call me old fashioned, it's only the fucking definition of the word, and it's nice to be building something with a function, but while I was supposed to build a factory that's automated to a certain degree, I found that the time I could spend building a robot production line was better spent running around gathering easy ingredients and flooding the market with as many shitty unvaried soup combinations as I could. Essentially, I was being the soup equivalent of EA. If you are a fan of exploratory freedom type sandboxes, you may find onomatopoeic word relating to food consumption galaxy a bit restrictive, since you can't venture too far without creating a return journey too long to make a decent production line, and the planets get kind of samey once you dig below the surface, not unlike kidnap victims, but I enjoy it for the same reason I enjoy coding. When I've set up a complex conveyor belt network that on its first test drops everything it carries into the space behind the fridge, I'm like, damn it, I can never remember when I need a semicolon. And then I spend the whole mission manually carrying stuff up the conveyor belts, which in this metaphor is when you give up and hard code everything. So let's narrow our focus from a something galaxy to a something planet. Freedom Planet is an action platformer that deliberately aims to resemble a game on the Sega Genesis, excepting of course that it's about half a gig, and if it were on the Sega Genesis it would have needed a cartridge about the size of a wardrobe. But that aside, it's a rather convincing imitation of a Genesis game, and by by that I mean one specific Genesis game, Sonic the Hedgehog, or rather Sonic the Hedgehog 3, right down to the multiple types of shields and background design more cluttered than a magic eye picture. But since it was after Sonic 3 that the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise officially abandoned its potential for good games to focus more on trying to sand off its own eyelids on the floor of a car park, then it's perfectly reasonable for something to hop into the niche it left behind. But let's be blunt, Freedom Planet is a Sonic fan game. The giveaway is that it has a classic mode. You came out last year, Freedom Planet, if you're a classic then I'm a World War II veteran. You mean classic Sonic mode. That is, just the levels back to back with no cutscenes, a mode that I am going to really fucking recommend. I'm going to hold that shit up like that monkey in The Lion King, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. To the game's credit, it replicates the feel and the pace of Sonic uncannily well, although Sonic was quite elegantly designed and Freedom Planet suffers from overcomplicating the gameplay a tad. I played through as the green cat thing, and I still couldn't tell you why only one of my two functionally identical melee attacks drained weapon energy. There is a hated live system, but you just continue from the same point if you run out, so it's really just a nod to retro gaming about as vestigial as the tongue of a castrated dog. On the whole, it's a solid game whose gameplay and art design reflects real effort, talent and enthusiasm. Which is why it just breaks my little heart to have to say that the story cocks it up a filthy drain pipe. The voice acting is the warning sign. Firstly, every character has noticeably different audio quality, as if all the actors were recording in different bedrooms. And secondly, there's voice acting. 
You say, despite obviously being a big fan of the Retrosonics, Freedom Planet paradoxically failed to notice the vital point that Retrosonic kept his fucking mouth shut. On a world of anthropomorphic cartoon animals that's legally speaking totally not Mobius, a bunch of original characters do not steal, who are all irritating, smart-mouthed, improbably skilled warriors, because this is the bad anime thing where every character is under 18 but has had three careers already, get enlisted to save the world for no reason besides obviously being great, and it plays out like bad self-insert fan fiction, which it may well technically be. All characterization is established by having the cast verbally explain their personalities to each other. At one point one of the three main playable characters says to the others something like, wait, you two finally agree on something? And I said aloud, what are you on about? They have never disagreed up to now. They first met two levels ago when you all decided on the spot to become BFFs and have a slumber party. And while we're on the subject, why the fuck did you interrupt gameplay for five minutes to make me watch that? Were the authors writing about these characters before they put them in this game, I wonder? Oh Christ, we're playing as someone's first sona, aren't we? I know people will tell me I'm just a misery gut who expects too much of everything, but fuck you. You know where we end up if we all stop expecting much? Two words, President Trump. Now, I'm not an expert at naming things, as can be evidenced from the fact that I call myself Yahtzee for no better reason than to embarrass myself every time I give my name for a takeout order, but I do know that if you're gonna make a game about uncovering the truth behind a mystery, maybe you don't give the answer in the fucking title. So we start Everybody's Gone to the Rapture and think, wow, an intriguing deathly silence hangs over this remote but apparently once vibrant village community. I wonder what could have... oh. Uh, well, maybe if we explore it thoroughly we might find a couple of survivors to talk to or interact with. No, you won't, because everybody's gone. That's what everybody means. If it qualifies as a body, then it is gone. Just wander about and listen to the lovely music for two or three hours. So have they literally gone to the rapture then? Well, maybe that's the mystery you can piece together on the way. Kind of a moot point now, isn't it? The everybody's gone already gave the game away. We already know we're not going to find shit. Doesn't matter whether they went to rapture or to Rotherham. Everybody's gone to the rapture, I hope Andrew Ryan set up enough guest rooms, <laughs> is a game in massive bleeding sarcasm quotes by the Chinese room. The developers of Dear Esther and Amnesia Red Metaphor for Pigs. So that's three games and a grand total of zero characters they've had to render so far, unless you count pigs, but clearly that was on sufferance because they're back to the Dear Esther comfort zone for Rapture. You wander around in first person as the story is brought across through disembodied voices. All that passes for gameplay is looking for the next place to stand to make another disembodied voice play. To that end, there's a weird glowing light trail thing that indicates towards places with slightly infuriating vagueness. It'll lead you all the way down one path and then psych, turn around and lead you all the way back up it again. It's like trying to walk a dog that hasn't quite decided which tree it's going to piss up today. So let's call everybody's going on holiday what is his, a walking simulator. That new breed of narrative driven game like your Gone Homes and your Stanley Parables that thinks its writing is so clever it doesn't even need gameplay to back it up. And Everybody Goes to Ravenholm is a walking simulator in the most literal sense. Would it really have killed the intended rich story experience to give us a fucking run button? Hey, everybody loves Raymond. I walked all the way across this meadow you didn't fence off and found nothing but beautifully rendered grass and a snotty handkerchief. Any chance I could get back to the main road in some manner faster than Stephen Hawking trying to get across a shingle beach. What? I thought you liked pacing. I meant in the sense of narrative structuring. Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. I put you down for walking around in circles for four hours. Now, walking simulators have always felt for me like a method of storytelling only slightly better than trying to read a book that's been glued to the side of a nervous gazelle, but maybe that's just the nihilist hardcore gamer talking who hasn't had a good day if he hasn't died by proxy at least five times. Let's momentarily buy into the notion that challenge isn't necessarily a component of interactive storytelling and judge the sarcasm quotes game by its narrative alone. Well, if you insist, everybody put your hands in the air like you just don't care. The setting is an idyllic English village community, so I hope you like post-war prefab housing because you're gonna see a lot of it. Oh look, this one's got a plastic slide in the back garden, slow this fucking roller coaster down! A scientist and complete douche balloon who grew up there returns with his American scientist wife and the pair of them proceed to science it up in a local observatory, after which a strange phenomenon starts causing the population to mysteriously disappear one by one. We gather all this from glowing particle effects that hover around replaying past conversations between the disappeared residents. I guess Chinese room really don't trust themselves to depict human characters visually, perhaps because they'd all look like fence posts with nice haircuts, but it would be nice to have had something besides voice to go on when we're trying to tell the motherfuckers apart. There are a few people with comically broad Welsh and West Country accents that turn the experience into the Archers meets Quatermass and the Pit. Blimey, no one's going to fucking get that one. But besides that, there's like five guys on the slightly posh dude of average age spectrum. I suppose my first major problem with the story is that I assumed I was crawling through the village on my overloaded mobility scooter to discover the nature of the mysterious event that happened to it. It's rather swiftly established that everyone got disappeared by space magic, but after completing the game I still didn't have any explanation explanation better than everyone got disappeared by space magic, which raised the obvious question of what the hell we have been learning for the last three hours. Well, we know that the scientist guy is a complete douche balloon because his mum is the Lord High Empress of the busybody cattle cunts, and we witnessed a bunch of other interpersonal conflicts that all ended rather anticlimactically when, you guessed it, everyone got disappeared by space magic. But you know what? Everybody Wants to Rule the World was never intended to be traditional storytelling, what with events playing out for us in essentially random order. So now as well as being glued to the side of a gazelle, the book's being chewed up by the honey badger riding on the gazelle's back. Maybe it 
rather than a linear mystery to be unlocked by the end, I should see it as immersing myself in the larger world of the characters. The problem with that is, I don't like any of the characters, and I'd sooner immerse myself in a vat of cold marmite. I think I'm supposed to sympathise with the American scientist lady, because this is rural England and the locals read the words American scientist lady the same way they read the words Venusian ballerina crab, but she's hardly meeting them halfway, treating them like idiots and reacting hypersensitively to their blissful ignorance, like a cat that shares a litter box with a hedgehog. So on the whole, I can't say I recommend everybody's a little bit racist, but just to be clear, I'm not averse to the whole interactive narrative bit, just because at no point in them do I get ambushed by skeleton warriors. Stanley Parable, for example, is really good, but that's because the story is driven by the actions of the player. Everybody Do the Dinosaur is not interactive narrative, it's just plain old narrative classics scattered to the winds, like we're trying to listen to a radio with really patchy reception, or indeed read a book that was glued to a gazelle and a honey badger until they all fell into a wood chipper. Christ, Chinese Rome, what have you got against gazelles? Between Volume, V for Vendetta, and Children of Men, I'm noticing that the world of fiction finds it curiously easy to believe that a near future Britain would become a fascist dictatorship. It's like all British people are sitting on the edges of their settees watching Countdown, just waiting for the economy to dip a few more points so they can gleefully fling their teacups aside and start taking the truncheon to the underclasses. And speaking as a British person, this never rings true for me. Now, I admit I haven't been in Britain for nigh on ten years now, so maybe Carol Vorderman founded a neo-fascist revolutionary movement while I wasn't paying attention, but most of the British people I know, if you invited them to truncheon an underclass for the greater glory of the superior British race, most of them would reply with, oh I wouldn't want anyone to think I was making a fuss before apologising for no reason. At the height of the empire, maybe, but I just don't think there's anything the modern British care enough about to inspire violent dictatorships, except maybe football. Volume is a new game by Mike you're probably pronouncing my surname wrong Bithel, which thrusted something thick and powerful right up my intrigue socket because his last game was the very enjoyable Thomas Was Alone, a game that successfully demonstrated just how much context can add by creating an absorbing experience from just a voice narration and a match-coloured shape to whole puzzle for babies. Volume takes things in a bit of a different direction from Thomas, where Thomas was a story prominently featuring sentient artificial intelligences, Volume prominently features artificial sentient intelligences. But from the starting point of Thomas Was Alone, Volume cranks the story presence down a notch and the gameplay up a tad, being a level-based top-down stealth game owing something to the early Metal Gears in which masked hero Rob Loxley must evade security as he steals from the fascist regime of Guy Gisborne. Want to make the cultural illusion a little more obvious, Mike? I think there's still a nest of baby eagles on the upper slopes of the Himalayas that haven't figured it out yet. Now, any indie developer worth his salt these days has figured out that the best way to get exposure is to court the Let's Play and streaming communities online. And I should say Mike's worth enough salt to rain down at least a moderate slug genocide, so volume opens with a rather unsubtle message along the lines of, hey, if you'd like to stream or LP this to your massive amounts of money having followers, then I'm totally down with that, winky face. In itself, not uncommon, but then we see the true master plan when we discover that the plot is attempting to contrive a scenario in which a streamer can be the hero by streaming. So not so much courting streamers as holding them down for sloppy makeouts. And how contrived it is! The entire game takes place in Rob's mum's basement, where he uses a hologram VR setup to recreate real-life centres of power and wealth, a lot of which are museums for some reason, and demonstrate how to steal from them so that other, less scrawny people with more dynamic voice acting can go out and do the actual legwork, forgetting that real-life guards probably won't have visibility cones straight from the world's most disappointing ice cream parlour. It'd be like streaming Pokemon in an effort to teach the world about animal husbandry. Thankfully, the sheer stable boy infuriating amount of bullshit inherent in the idea of someone being lionised for streaming himself running around pretend buildings resting his balls on everything is not something that goes unaddressed, but the main villain is so sneering goatee strokingly evil that it rather undermines the moral complexity the plot reaches for in the second half, and which leads to a rather insipid ending that goes, ooh, was Rob doing the right thing by streaming himself resting his balls on stuff? I guess only the future will tell. As we used to say in the Heinz tasting facility, that's fucking weak sauce. Feel free to blow me out of the water because this is me just taking a wild guess, but I suspect that they might possibly have been going for a Robin Hood analogy, and Robin Hood is supposed to be about nice, straightforward good and evil. Rob Rich, give poor, Errol Flynn, whoosh crikey, ha ha foul villain, and homoerotic overtones. Not that you couldn't try a gritty reimagining, but volume suffers from trying to have it both ways. Kicking off with the big boys fun club tweaking the nose at the fist shaking villain stuff, and then suddenly trying to stroke its chin at us out of nowhere. In short, for Christ's sake, take a fucking stand on what point you're trying to make, I'll just be over here playing through the levels while you figure it out. It's not the most sophisticated stealth game in the world, I imagine that the guards in real life, as well as having peripheral vision wider than a gnat's chuff, will also hunt around for slightly longer than eight picoseconds before concluding that it must have been a momentary gust of wind that ran in front of them, stole all the valuables and rested its balls on the kitchen worktop. It's fairly easy to fudge most of the puzzles by letting the guards see you, running off and standing behind a middling width lamppost so they think you're a magic disappearing wizard with whom they definitely don't want to mess, then trot back to whatever they were guarding while they're trudging back to their patrol route with their dreams of glory shattered. Some kind of extra bonus for completing the level without being spotted wouldn't have gone amiss. Something to throw out for the hundred percenters, as one would throw a hiking partner's severed leg to a hyena pack as you make a break for the car. It has annoyances, the slightly angled top-down viewpoint makes it hard to tell if Rob is standing between two moving laser beams or if he's about to trip one with his great big please with himself stiffy. But overall the gameplay is not bad, which is kind of the problem. If it were bad I could have at least extracted some amusement from stabbing myself in the thighs. Just like Thomas 
Thomas was alone, without context it'd be a big boring bubble of bugger all, and as much as I found the story lacking I wish there'd been more of it. Thomas was alone kept me involved by having an almost constant narration, but in volume entire groups of levels go by without the plot moving forward, or more often shuffling to the side like it's trying to fit everyone into a wedding photo. Brings to mind that old piece of writing advice, is this the most interesting period of our protagonist's life, and if not, why aren't you showing us that? Essentially all we do is play a hundred levels practicing at being a master thief. I mean you'd usually skip past all this with a montage and a Kenny Loggins track.